Warning, the following podcast contains adult language, themes, and situations. Also, the film we're about to talk about is going to be spoiled thoroughly. Listener discretion is advised. Enjoy this show. Believe it or not, once upon a time, Nicolas Cage was considered to be too quirky to star in an action blockbuster. But luckily for us, Nick took this to be a challenge rather than a roadblock. And in 1996, he embarked on a nearly 20-year action voyage that only Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance had the power to shipwreck. So how in the name of Zeus's butthole did a quirky indie film character actor, fresh off an Oscar-winning performance as an alcoholic screenwriter, become the action star of the 90s? We'll find out as we lock ourselves in solitary confinement with the only Michael Bay movie I'll ever contemplate considering a classic, The Rock. Okay, let's run. Ha <laughs> I'm like a prickly pear. I... What do you say we cut the chit-chat a-hole? Fuck! Porker! How did you burn? How did you burn? How did you burn? Hey, have you ever been dragged to the sidewalk and beat until you pissed blood? Welcome to One Cage at a Time, the show where we break down every single Nicolas Cage movie, one film at a time. Here are your hosts, Patrick, Vince, and Nigel. When a disgruntled general threatens to unleash deadly chemical weapons on the city of San Francisco, the FBI turns to an unlikely hero in the form of chemical warfare expert named Stanley Goodspeed and a former British spy slash top secret prisoner to break into Alcatraz to dismantle the weapons before they can be launched. Dun 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 you got to do that Pirates of the Caribbean Pirates music. of the Caribbean theme. <laughs> <laughs> Let's meet the stars of the film. The rock star's four-time Oscar nominee, Ed Harris, the only man who could keep Eddie King in check during Deadfall, Michael Bean, H.I. <laughs> McDonough's old cellmate, William Forsyth, the one and only Claire Forlani, Sean Connery as James Bond, and of course, why don't we just cut the chit-chat, a-holes, Academy Award-winning actor Nicholas Kim Coppola, better known as Nicholas Cage. It's time to go over some of the finer details. The Rock was released on June seventh, nineteen ninety-six, at a budget of seventy-five million dollars and made three hundred and thirty-five point one million. Definitely a hit. Yep. Uh, this was, mm-hmm. uh, as we previously mentioned in our uh, Con Air and Face Off episodes, this was the first of the uh, Holy Trinity of uh, Nick Cage action movies. He did all three of those movies right in a row. So The Rock, then Face Off, then Con Air. <laughs> Pretty much filmed Con Air and Face Off at the same time. No, it was the other way around. So Con Air came out first, and then Face Off. Which, uh, I don't know if we talked about it, but... Um, Don Simpson, who who died shortly after The Rock was finished, I don't think he he uh, made it to The Rock actually premiering, but he was very against Con Air. <laughs> he hated the <laughs> idea, didn't want anything to do with it, and it was actually causing a lot of tension between him and Bruckheimer, and they were about to go their separate ways anyway, and then Don Simpson had a massive heart attack, and that was the end of that. Wow. Um, but Don Simpson... And Jerry Bruckheimer started this relationship way back. Uh, I think Lethal Weapon was like when they first started, and yeah, I Br- think Bruckheimer's he- still going to this day. <laughs> yeah. Well, that he makes was. me a Don Simpson fan because I think he was, <laughs> I think he was making the right call there. Con Air is the Dear worst you. of these three. <laughs> this was directed by the one and only, my least favorite director, and and if I had an arch nemesis in this world, I would I would say that that's the man, <laughs> Michael Bay. A little bit more so than Paul Schrader. Oh, I would. I would. In a world where Harvey Weinstein exists, and <laughs> well, he was a producer. Oh, uh, yeah, they're all ooh, terrible. All yeah. right. <laughs> uh, now I just, you know, I mean, I guess, I guess that's uh, a bit extreme. <laughs> Are you to saying say Michael Bay is worse Bay. than Brett Ratner? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just level? don't <laughs> like him from a filmmaking standpoint. Yeah, uh, not yeah, not yeah. as a person, uh, <laughs> though he doesn't seem like the greatest person in the world but, <laughs> but anyways anyways <laughs> uh 
Uh, so six time golden raspberry nominee, Michael Bay directed this film. <laughs> um, uh, we'll just quickly go through his, uh, his laundry list of wonderful movies here. Uh, bad boys one, which was actually good. Um, I, I would feel like bad boys and the rock were the first two movies that he did. And he did, he, those were Bruckheimer productions. Mm-hmm. Um, and then after that, they had some sort of falling out after Armageddon and he never worked with Bruckheimer again. And there is a considerable uh, quality drop after that. So if you watch <laughs> Bad Boys 2, uh, the hey, Transformers hey, 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 movies. Hey, 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 hey. Bad Boys 2 is a good film. <laughs> Not every movie throws dead bodies out of a moving vehicle. Uh, every movie Michael does. Bay movie does. <laughs> <laughs> um, he did The Island, which is actually... Uh, one of his better movies. Uh, I feel like we've <coughs> talked about that on this this show at some point. Of course, Transformers 1 through 15. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and other awful movies such as Pearl Harbor. <laughs> Pearl Harbor was also a uh, Bruckheimer production. So yeah. maybe it was that was the last one. So, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> How do you make it through doing Pearl Harbor and not want to... <laughs> Break off any relationship with Michael Bay. Forever. How do you turn such an interesting story in American history into <laughs> one of the worst movies ever? Such a, ugh, that movie is so terrible. I'm so glad Nick Cage is not in that movie. <laughs> I'm not, I wish he was. That would have been awesome. <laughs> no, we get we get wind talkers instead. Yeah, yeah, that was actually a decent yeah. movie. <laughs> um, pain and gain. Uh. And most recently, uh, Ambulance, which is uh, bringing out the dead's handicapped cousin. Um, (laughs) Got to start with music videos, of course, Uh, commercials, and softcore porn. Uh, (laughs) Nice. Before becoming the poster child for over-the-top, awful blockbuster action movies, which he describes as movies for teenage boys. So anytime he gets criticized, he's like, what do you expect? It's movies for teenage boys. What do you want me to do? (laughs) Uh, Make sure to check out Carrie Kendall's Playboy Centerfold September 1990 video shoot to see his early work with comically ridiculous camera angles, over-the-top character reveals, and obnoxious yellow and teal color grades. <laughs> so he's always had a style. <laughs> now, actually, he didn't. I, yeah. <laughs> it's actually pretty good. It's, it's a well-produced film. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we should heard. watch it. <laughs> uh, written by uh, writing partners David Weisberg and Douglas Cook who went on to write such household names as Double Jeopardy with Tommy Lee Jones and Ashley Judd, as well as uh, Criminal with Kevin Costner. You've seen that, right? Mm Mm-mm. No, no, nobody has. And (laughs) literally nothing else. There's nothing else on their uh, (laughs) writing credits. Though there's like a hundred people who came in and like added little things. Like Tarantino apparently was a uh, script doctor on this film. (laughs) On this film? Yes, (laughs) Yes, <laughs> on The Rock. Right. That's weird. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm wondering, because Abrams, J.J. Abrams was a script doctor who came in on uh, Gone in 60 Seconds, so I wonder <laughs> if he had been tapped in this at all. But the uh, story was by Mark Rosner, <laughs> who went on to write some stuff I've never heard of, uh, besides a couple episodes of Blue Bloods. Um, so it's kind of weird that it's not... Like, you know, usually Michael Bay uh, and Bruckheimer especially seem to have these go-to writers. But on this one, they kind of grabbed some uh, unknowns and uh, they remained unknown <laughs> after The Rock. So Yeah. Hmm. And weird. Well, I mean, it was kind of early for at least Michael Bay's career. So I can understand him not really having a catalog of guys to come in. But Bruckheimer, yeah. I'm surprised he didn't bring in some more powerful yeah. writers. I mean, I'm surprised that that guy who uh, did Con Air and uh, and Gone in 60 Seconds didn't have any involvement in this, but maybe maybe uh, <laughs> Con Air was his first time getting into Dude, that he, camp. Who knows? Yeah. This was uh, shot by Talia Shire's stepson slash honorary Coppola, John <laughs> Schwartzman, who is uh, really? Jason Schwartzman's brother. Or, <laughs> yeah, I think brother, right? Because wow. John – or. Uh, Ah, uh, I think it's James. It's too many J's. Um, 
The other Schwartzman is his dad, so John would be his brother. Okay, yeah. So <laughs> Nick Cage's cousins. You, you get it, right? <laughs> sure. <laughs> so Talia Shire remarried. I think it's Jack, actually. Jack Schwartzman, I think is his name. A lot of J's in that family for some reason. <laughs> He's had a uh, super long, successful career, but a few highlights include Airheads, uh, if nice. you guys remember that movie from yeah. the, the uh, Adam Sandler movie, um, the early 90s. That was like kind of the beginning of Sandler. Also shot uh, other movies with Michael Bay, including Armageddon, um, which is just an absolute dumpster fire in my opinion i hate that movie so much it gave us one of the greatest songs ever though i know a lot of people who really love that movie and and i, just, uh, I hate it um like also the nostalgia factor yeah but i think so not a yeah good movie that's it. i mean so. if you really yeah uh, it's not a good movie but we're uh, a deep a, impact family <laughs> yeah i was actually in the same thing i was like I like Deep Impact better than. Yeah. <laughs> Though if you watch Deep Impact now, it doesn't hold up very it doesn't well hold either. Up. No. <laughs> also shot Pearl Harbor, uh, Jurassic World one and uh, not the second one. I felt like the second one had a lot of promise. It was almost like a horror movie with dinosaurs. <laughs> but that's where I lost me. <laughs> it was just oh man, those Jurassic World movies are so bad, especially that third one. Holy crap. I still haven't crap. watched it yet. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't care to watch the third one. <laughs> Literally only watched it to see the OG <laughs> Matt, cast from the original Jurassic Park. I feel like the first one wasn't that bad, but it wasn't I liked great. the first one. Yeah, it wasn't and great, then, but the second yeah. one, yeah, it just kind of fell apart. The there. <laughs> <clears throat> like, you know, if you don't have a story to tell, just don't, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, first Amazing Spider-Man movie, so that was the uh, uh, Andrew Garfield, Andrew Garfield yeah. one, uh, which was pretty good. That's pretty um, good, yeah, yeah, it was a good one. Looks good, movie. It's good, or good looking film. Yeah, <laughs> and in a departure from popcorn films, he also shot Saving Mr. Banks, um, wow. which I don't think he was Oscar nam- nominated for, but that movie was Oscar nominated, and uh, he actually got a, a nomination for Sea Biscuit. So oh, cool, oh, Sea Biscuit. Wow. Uh, had one other collaboration with Nicolas Cage, uh, which we will be doing this season, National Treasure Book of Secrets. Yeah. Oh. So we will be seeing um, John Schwartzman again. Edited by Richard Francis Bruce, who has been working since 1974 and has been nominated for three Oscars for Shawshank Redemption. I mean, you brought the Shawshank Redemption guy in to do The Rock? Why? No. <laughs> Because he's the only one that could save it. <laughs> that, maybe that's why this movie <laughs> yeah. is actually pretty coherent and good. Coherent, yeah. Uh, uh, also edited one of my favorite movies of all time, Seven, and uh, did Air Force One. Oh, also edited man, the he's got first some bangers in his lineup. <laughs> the first Harry Potter film uh, of the eight, I think. Um, mm-hmm. The Green Mile, The Italian Job, and. Ghost Rider, so he's perfect. <laughs> they, had him, they had him do Green Mile as well as Shawshank. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I forgot he did Ghost Rider. <laughs> I, I knew he was involved with Nick somehow. Other than <laughs> um, Music by Nick Lenny Smith. And, uh, you know, you'll notice it throughout. Uh, there's a real Pirates of the Caribbean vibe through this movie. Uh, Hans Zimmer also <laughs> did music for this. All right. We've like <laughs> talked about Hans Zimmer about 20 times already. Yeah. Um, Smith is apparently Zimmer's go-to conductor really? like when he's putting music together. So I guess Smith kind of has a conducting career of his own, but um, uh, as a solo composer, he's only done uh, Home Alone 3, Lion King 2, Highlander Endgame, um, and his most recognizable movie was We Were Soldiers. So hmm. hasn't done a ton on his own um, as a uh, composer. But as a conductor, he's worked on almost everything – on Zimmer has ever done ratings. Uh, it's got a 67%, which is actually pretty decent. If you think about these kind of, uh, uh, Bruckheimer esque films, I don't know how many have gotten, you know, 60 or above <laughs> from, from the <laughs> critics. The audience always loves these movies. Yeah. But critics. The pirates got, cause I feel like those movies were loved by probably critics. really high, pretty high. I would imagine. And I, not that great. Like I could not, 
it was just so much crap going on. I remember I watched the first Pirates in the theater and I was like, I have no idea what is happening in this film. I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> and it wasn't until the rewatch where I like was able to kind of like, oh, okay. Oh, all right. So that connects to this and that connects to this. And it was just such a convoluted mess. So if, like the first viewing, I was just like, what in the hell is happening in this movie? <laughs> I've seen those movies multiple times. And I still have no clue what the plot of it's, them. Okay. Yeah. I, the first one I got weird. down. The other ones I don't. I don't. Really. I couldn't 80. tell you. First one got an 80 on Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, it's pretty high. They love those pirates. Ugh. Yeah. Audience score of 86. So, but pretty simpatico. <clears throat> I don't feel like any of those movies were, like, good. <laughs> I think the first one's pretty good. We watched really? it. We okay. watched it recently. First one's pretty good. Um, six point six out of ten on seventy two reviews uh, for that sixty seven percent audience. Of course, eighty five percent, almost universally loved. I do like, like I've said, I think this is the best of the uh, three uh, big cage action movies that kind of mm-hmm. launched his yeah. his action side of things. Because, you know, you got to think about what Cage was doing prior to this. He was doing, you know, Moonstruck, Raising Arizona, (laughs) uh, Vampire's Kiss. (laughs) Leaving Las Vegas. Uh, Leaving Las Vegas. Wild at Heart. uh, Red Rock West. (laughs) Like, he had done mostly indie, quirky kind of movies. And then he got tapped after winning that Oscar to be part of a big tentpole uh, summer blockbuster movie. And that launched you know, him into being an action star, which, you know, he really isn't the action star of this movie. Sean Connery is, Mm -hmm. uh, and Michael Bean, I guess for his brief, for like two seconds, (laughs) brief appearance in the film. (laughs) But, um, you know, him going from being the goofy scientist, who's kind of the secondary lead to con air after this. Yeah. (laughs) This is a bit of a leap. Um, but you know, he got shredded for that, so that's you know he he won the hearts of America, <laughs> those glistening abs, and then he mm-hmm. got face off after that, and that cemented him forever. Metacritic score was fifty eight percent, so substantially lower. Jeez. IMDb seven point four out of ten. So again, the audience definitely loves this movie, and then the uh, cinema score was an A. So audience. Definitely responded well to this in the theater. Makes sense. This is like prime time for these action films, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A- America was primed for these just mm-hmm. dumb popcorn <laughs> summer blockbusters. Yeah. yeah. They were everywhere uh, yeah. th- during that brief period of, I mean, really the 90s in general, just from beginning yeah. to end, it was just Cr- yeah. wall to wall slapstick speed, yeah like speed you know? and all that <laughs> yeah. shit like all those just really cheesy mm-hmm. over the top action films yeah i mean there's definitely some gems in there but then like the early 2000s kind of ruined it by going too far yeah. over the top it's almost like those when you see like a clip from an india a, a movie from india and you're like whoa oh, yeah. okay. like RRR. I don't know if you guys have seen yeah. that. it's just like <laughs> over the top <laughs> how about a coppola quick facts um, as I mentioned earlier, a, a bunch of different people uh, did uncredited work on this, including Quentin Tarantino, uh, Jonathan Hensley, and um, Aaron Sorkin. Aaron Sorkin. <laughs> they were like, really? reach out to Aaron Sorkin to, to rewrite on The Rock. Let's punch up the president's dialogue for that one scene. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Make the uh, politicians uh, seem more believable. Also, the uh, <laughs> avoiding rape in the showers scene. <laughs> I feel like that was a Tarantino. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Beach getting raped in the shower. <laughs> getting feet fucked yeah, in the say shower. Say it, Sean Connery. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, producer Don Simpson was largely responsible for creating the critical General Hummel character, which I feel like is uh, really kind of the linchpin of this movie. Is like you actually kind of empathize with General Hummel through the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Like he's actually a good uh, antagonist that we don't really see in these kinds of movies. Like he he actually. Yeah has real character motivation and actually turns out to be kind of a good guy in the end. Yeah. Uh, it's like the, it's like a reverse heel turn. <laughs> like, yeah. He's a bad guy that turns kind of good. Yeah. But, um, yeah. 
Well, he comes to his senses, I guess. You know, and right. I right. Like, it's like he was never really bad in the first place, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Kind of the, he was never it. really planning on doing these things, as we'll yeah. we'll talk about as we do the breakdown. But like, um, you know, even threatening it is pretty pretty messed up. But yeah. you know, he and, had to take extreme measures since the government yeah. was not doing anything for it. And right. having somebody like Ed Harris play that character just yeah. made it even more well rounded. He's Adds so, so much at, more gravitas yeah, to that. He's so good at like really <laughs> filling out characters like that and giving them yeah. depth. Ed Harris is a very underrated actor, I feel like. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, even though he's been, I think he's got, what, three Oscar nominations. Mm-hmm. Um, Did he win anything for Westworld? I don't know. He might have. I can't, uh, I can't remember. He should have, man. He was I feel so like there was some Golden show. Globe nominations. Yeah. Um, maybe some Emmys, but uh, yeah, especially that first season, he was great in that. God, he was so good. Uh, Pollock, too. If you ever watched that Jackson Pollock um biopic oh he's so good in that movie um simpson had watched a uh, 60 minutes uh segment about the u.s government's refusal to acknowledge soldiers who had died during covert overseas missions and later read (laughs) colonel david h hackworth's memoirs which harshly criticized u.s planning during the vietnam war he combined these elements into Hummel's character and, as Jonathan Hensley described, created a really compelling villain, a soldier with a no- noble end, but unfortunately psychotic means. Um, and then okay. this film, of course, is dedicated to producer Don Simpson, who died during production, uh, sadly. And uh, I believe the Con- I believe Con Air was dedicated to him as well. Yeah, I think so, too. Which he would have been pissed about. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's interesting because uh, if you guys haven't read anything about Hackworth, he was very he was very successful uh, in the army, especially during Vietnam. And then when he got out, like really gave it to the government about how they handled things to the point where he left and ended up living in Australia, I believe, <clears throat> for the rest of his life because wow. they were not uh, too thrilled with him being outspoken about the Vietnam War and how they mishandled and fumbled the fucking thing. <clears throat> but so seems he's, like, he's yeah. got like two memoirs that are Definite really, really inspiration good. for Hummel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's how we treat our heroes in America. Yeah. So that's pretty interesting. <laughs> it adds a little more depth to that character too, bringing stuff like that yeah. into it. Very rare to see a well-rounded antagonist in any of these <laughs> movies. They're usually just evil for the sake of being evil. Yeah. Producers Don Simpson and Jerry Bruckheimer had decided they were going to dissolve their partnership when the production of this movie finished, mostly due to Bruckheimer taking issue with Simpson's drug abuse problems. Uh, Simpson, however, died of drug abuse related heart failure during this movie. I just, I wonder if like the stress of, Making this movie, drugs, and uh, his tumultuous relationship with Jerry Bruckheimer kind of led to what ended up happening. I also don't think that he saw Cage as like a an action star um, for whatever reason. I feel like Cage can yeah. kind of do anything, really. Uh, as yeah. we've seen, you can kind of put him in any type of movie and he'll he'll float to the top. And even this, like you said before, he wasn't the action star. Mm-hmm. He was like the sidekick, really, to Sean yeah. Connery. Sean Connery was the one doing the majority of the yeah. action. He was uh, blind firing a pistol horribly <laughs> into the fucking <laughs> ear. <laughs> one thing, like, um, I feel like it's a it's a nonstop trope in these types of movies is taking the geeky character and everybody just mm-hmm. makes fun of him the whole time. But I feel like <clears> they <throat> did end up giving him respect uh, from the chemical side of things, but yeah. um, not so much from him you know, helping them in any kind of way (laughs) outside of (laughs) defusing the bombs. He's useless. (laughs) Yeah. Which is, you know, it's great Mm -hmm. that he didn't just, he just shows up to this and he's automatically good at it. Yeah. I do appreciate that. He doesn't just become like a weapon expert. Yeah. Which happens in tons of movies where they take the geeky scientists and suddenly they're just like getting headshots on every Chuck. The late great Tony Scott was uh, originally supposed to direct this movie, but turned it down to direct the fan. I don't know if you've seen that movie, but that one's pretty great. De Niro um, becoming an obsessed fan and he gets pissed off at Wesley Snipes is like a, uh, Barry Bonds esque player. Tony Scott was, I feel like he's one of those directors who really added intelligence to the action genre. Like Ridley Scott mm-hmm. kind of skirts the line back and forth, but Tony Scott mm-hmm. really kind of made great, great action movies <laughs> that were actually 
engaging and intelligent. And they were grounded for action films. They were actually grounded. Like you compare Tony Scott film to a Michael Bay film and they're <laughs> vastly different. One's like yeah. written by a scholar. The other one's written by a five-year-old in his. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Michael Mann, you know, like yeah. Michael Mann movies are very like grounded and intelligent yeah, and, yeah. and thought out. Whereas a Michael Bay movie. <laughs> and Dan, then he gets in a, <laughs> uh, one of those carts and the railroads and shoots. <laughs> yeah, it's a fucking mine cart sequence for some reason. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we will talk about that extensively <laughs> once it comes up. Uh, I would say Ridley Scott, Tony Scott, best directing duo aside from the Coens, in, in my opinion. Says? I I would say, like, if you look at the body of work of Tony Scott and and Ridley Scott, yeah, 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 it trumps anything that uh, the Russos have done up to this point. I mean, the Russos might get there, but they're not there yet. This is a recurring thing in these uh, three movies that we've done, um, the Holy Trinity. Arnold Schwarzenegger was offered the role of John (laughs) Patrick Mason, (laughs) but at the time, the script was only 80 pages with a lot of handwriting and scribbles, and it didn't seem fully baked. In a uh, Reddit AMA, he stated that he regretted not taking the role. I mean, yeah, Sean Connery, dude. Uh, You're not going (laughs) to... Sean Connery is what makes this movie good, I think. Yeah, it would have been hilarious (laughs) to see an Arnold in that role. (laughs) (laughs) Fuck the the prom queen. (laughs) (laughs) Pete's getting gang raped in the showers. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, it was um nicholas cage's idea that his character would not swear um i'm guessing there weren't a ton of actual swears nigel Nah, there was a couple but i gave honorary mentions to (laughs) (laughs) a-hole because it's in the intro but (laughs) but he uh yeah his euphemisms include gee whiz a hole, Zeus butthole, friggin, <laughs> friggin, yeah, friggin. For a yeah. second, I thought, did I somehow manage to get like a TV friendly version? Because <laughs> I forgot that, that he doesn't, he doesn't. It's swear. funny because my 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 cage curse alarm would go off a couple of times where I'd be like, ah, he's gonna swear. Yeah, like, mm. you could, like I said, I mentioned before, you can kind of tell where he's building up to it, but he'll say like friggin, yeah, or, then he says yeah. friggin, something. Yeah, it was funny <laughs> that you PG. you mentioned that it feel like it it, it might have been. Um, trimmed down or like edited in some way because like there's the scene with uh i i don't remember his character name at all but i just call him candy man throughout the, the <laughs> breakdown because yeah. he was candy man um he like starts to say shit like three times during the final fight between him and cage mm-hmm. and it cuts it off so i wonder yeah. if they just like got over a limit or something i actually rewound it because i thought i missed a curse in that scene because i wasn't but it was like, oh no, Candyman was the one that said it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think they do I cut think it off. Maybe, it maybe they PG-13. cut it off because it has more effect when he actually says, Do you know how that shit works? Yeah. You know? Yeah, uh, yeah. Again, they, they probably cut out the other ones because it, it wouldn't be as funny if he had been saying shit <laughs> yeah. previous to that. <laughs> Doesn't Cage say it in that too? Yeah. He, he says, says it after he kills him, I think, <clears throat> yeah. which is why it's it's funny. Like true. I think they may have, they may have cut it out of the other earlier instances because of that line to make that line work a little better. <laughs> Or hit a little harder. Apparently, uh, Michael Bay was not a fan of the Zeus's butthole line, <laughs> but Cage <laughs> insisted on having it in there. Yeah, I could, I, <laughs> I could see, I that. see that. Yeah, <laughs> you're not going to definitely no felt like a, that whole that whole scene was like uh, this is a, this is a Cage improv, hundred uh, percent. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of out of character, and yeah, yeah. Yeah. Give me a uh, bad lieutenant vibes when he's like <laughs> going off on the old ladies. <laughs> <laughs> you fucks, I hate you both. <laughs> uh, reportedly, sh- Sir, I have to say, Sir Sean Connery, because he was knighted, accepted the part of Mason after learning that Nicolas Cage had been cast as Goodspeed. So, really, oh, we can thank Nick Cage awesome. for uh, for bringing Sean Connery into this movie. I felt like right they there. had really good co- chemistry between the yeah, two of them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I kind of wish that they had done something else together as they were really great. I'd love to see just a buddy cop movie with the two of them. 
Sean Connery insisted the producers build a cabin for him on Alcatraz because he didn't want to travel <laughs> to the uh, mainland um, every day. It's literally like a 15-minute ride. Yeah, That's too much time, dude. I guess. But he got what he asked for, and they built him a little cabin on the— Figure that, the, or they put him in the Fairmont the whole time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that would make sense. That's where Sean Connery should stay. Mm-hmm. Um, He's such but, an interesting guy. He's a weird guy. He may have just wanted to say he got to live on Alcatraz for a month or whatever. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, it's funny because they had tours going on the whole time that they were there. So. <laughs> oh, this is Sean Connery's cabin. <laughs> this is Sean Connery's cabin over there. <laughs> oh, welcome. <laughs> um, welcome I talk to about the it, rock. <laughs> I talk about it at some point in here that he uh, went golfing during production like almost every day so it's like what well, what's the point of like staying on the freaking island i don't know build me a golf course on alcatraz <laughs> right in the prison showers coming through four <laughs> this is a uh, a recurring uh, conspiracy theory um which is very famous on the internet There's several theories that sean connery's character is in fact an older version of his own james bond character however since sean last played the agent 007 in the unofficial bond movie never say never again the time setting of this movie would have to be 2013 um with John Patrick Mason being 83 years old. So, yeah. Um, but because they argu- mentioned he was locked up in 1963 I yes. think at some point. Yeah. <clears throat> Arguably never say never again is not part of the official James Bond canon. Um, mm-hmm. It was uh, uh, the guy who originally wrote Dr. No um, got temporary control of the rights and did that one movie that is, it's okay. Uh, it's not one of the best Bond movies, but um, yeah, it was the last time. You know, it was it was cool to see Connery come out of retirement and do it. But mm-hmm. uh, Moore was already Bond, <laughs> and, like had been Bond yeah. for a minute. You know, so um, it's like the official f- four Connery movies were Doctor No, Russia with Love, From Russia with Love, Goldfinger, Thunderball. Thunderball was in 1965, so you get kind of. Fudge it and be like, yeah, he was that version of Bond. You know, he was arrested in 63 and, and Thunderball took place in 63 or whatever. Yeah. Or you could say it was, you know, it was the From Russia with Love version of Bond that got arrested and those other two movies didn't happen. Mm-hmm. You could make it work. I choose to believe it because it makes the movie a lot more enjoyable. Yeah. <laughs> uh, independent, independent research shows multiple ties that can be interpreted to support the James Bond theory. And by ignoring the unofficial film, the timelines match perfectly, according to uh, IMDb here. <laughs> this theory is possibly de- debunked in the scene where General Hummel refers to John Mason as Sailor, and John Mason corrects him by saying it's Army, actually. James Bond was in the British Navy. Right. Um, or was he? Or was he? But yeah, I mean, he's already going by the name John Mason. <clears throat> Maybe he's just... Yeah. He's a secret agent. <laughs> he could be lying. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I choose to believe it because it's a much better send off for uh for yeah. Bond or uh, Connery's Bond. Connery's Bond. Uh, yeah. than never say never. I also like to imagine Bond breaking out of prison and then going to a Led Zeppelin concert to hook it up with some random <laughs> woman and some random <laughs> yeah. before getting caught and then arrested again and thrown back in prison. <laughs> yeah. Because it's funny. To it's funny that that's like what he chose to do when he broke out of prison. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's a rocker through and through, dude. Yeah. <laughs> Check out some of this rock and roll music. <laughs> I think he put on some grunge tapes after he <laughs> CDs after after the rock. I, mean, I would hope what so. Is this, what is this grunge? It's pretty <laughs> pretty dope. If this movie was made today, that would be the after credits scene. Is be him <laughs> listening, listening to some grunge in Seattle, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hanging out with his daughter, shooting heroin. <laughs> uh, uh, we've talked about this extensively online, but um, Ed Harris pointed out that he worked with Michael Bean in uh, The Abyss, saying that experience bound us a lot, or <laughs> that experience bound a lot of us together, almost like being in a war of some kind, because <laughs> James Cameron was basically just 
a nightmare to work with. And I've heard that he's a nightmare to work with in general. He's just a real asshole who likes to push people's buttons to get performances mm-hmm. out of them. But like he uh, almost drowned people several times. Uh, including Ed Harris. Including <laughs> Ed Harris on the abyss. And um, like, I don't know how you just don't quit. Like after he did something like that, like he, he was like pounding on the window, like don't like <laughs> stop uh, filling the water into my suit because they were drowning pretty much. But, you know, whatever. In Hollywood, you could just do whatever you want to the actors. Yeah, They're under money. contract. So, you know, Ed Harris would uh, also end up being the antagonist to Nick's protagonist in National Treasure Book Secrets, which uh, I'm excited to do that one because I don't remember a damn thing about that movie. <laughs> it has something to do with the Book Lincoln the assassination and John Wilkes Booth and Civil War gold or something. I don't, I don't remember exactly, but it'll be good to rewatch. Michael Bay heard from uh, James Cameron once that uh, various crew members had told him the two are very similar on set. That's something you want. (laughs) Jerry Bruckheimer says Cameron's a total asshole when he's working and asked Michael Bay why he'd want to emulate that. (laughs) Bruckheimer said for some reason he liked the image of being like the tough guy, the guy with the whip, the yeller and screamer. But Michael's a good guy. He's so obviously a sweet guy at heart. Talk to the crew. They'll give you another story. But as far as the actors are concerned, <laughs> they never had a hard time with him. So wow. he's just a scumbag to the people yeah, who... To the help. To the people yeah. that actually make his shit work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The people who are really the the muscle behind the operation. Yeah. It's how you treat service workers. That's... <laughs> tells people what kind exactly. of a good, what kind of a person you are. So, mm-hmm. yeah, take that for what he's <laughs> take treat, take, uh, take that for what it's worth. <laughs> treat the janitor the same as you would treat the the CEO. I feel like that's a good motto for life. Yep. The studio wanted this movie shot in Los Angeles. Somehow they wanted to do The Rock in Los <laughs> Angeles <laughs> with only a handful of exteriors of Alcatraz in San Francisco to complete the illusion. But director Michael Bay refused, telling them, I got to shoot this on the island because this island is so fucking bitching. <laughs> Direct <laughs> quote from Michael Bay. Wow. <clears throat> I, I hate that guy so much, dude. <laughs> I hate him. Uh, It took a while for Michael Bay to convince Nicolas Cage and Sir Sean Connery to go underwater while flames blasted above the surface at the, at the, um, the, you know, the under the tunnel Tunnel. scene. Yeah. But both actors eventually agreed. There are safety divers immediately outside of the frame during the sequence. um, But Cage said it was very terrifying and Sean Connery was not happy about it. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you know, yeah. It works for the action, so. It's a cool shot. It's a cool shot. Uh, this is a funny one. Uh, Nicholas Cage was concerned that he looked like a little Japanese schoolboy <laughs> in his scuba gear. <laughs> While the other uh, actors all looked cool. Michael Bay admits to what? intentionally making him look ridiculous. <laughs> I didn't really notice that. Yeah, um, me either. But <laughs> apparently Nick Cage did. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense that he looks out of place about yeah. a bunch of Navy SEALs. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. so. He should. <laughs> the premiere of this movie was actually held in the uh, rec yard at Alcatraz. Really? Was, uh, <laughs> nice. Pretty cool that they did that. Uh, that Alcatraz would allow that, really. Because, you know, I feel like the place is falling apart. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it's also, you know, it's a historical monument and they mm-hmm. make a lot of money off these tours. You wouldn't think that they would want to shut things down but i'm sure that they got a oh, huge they got a fat paycheck payday, dude. Yeah. yeah and finally in 2016 a chilcott report on britain's involvement in toppling saddam hussein noted that one agent who had falsified claims about observing weapons of mass destruction in iraq had based his description <laughs> of them on the nerve gas missiles featured in this movie <laughs> 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 so that's he, he gave that report to uh george bush and he was like yeah <laughs> when they just showed him the rock and like this is happening in iraq and he's like we gotta get those weapons <laughs> gotta stop those turfs gotta take them down. Take down oh they shoot. got 
They got uh, marbles full of green gas. <laughs> Kill us all. All right, it's time to break down the film one scene at a time. Act one. Why don't we set some shit up? Our Michael Bay, before he fell in love with Yellow and Teal film, begins with a military funeral where seven Marines bury a fallen comrade in full regalia in the middle of an empty field somewhere. The title card pops up, but it's completely made up of fire because, well, Michael Bay. <laughs> We see Ed Harris's character, General Hummel, having flashbacks to a funeral, some Apocalypse Now looking helicopters, and for some reason, just literally images of a fire because, well, Michael Bay. <laughs> we hear General Hummel over the images voicing his displeasure to Congress over something with how the government has treated fallen soldiers and their families who died or were injured on secret missions. He drops some flowers on his wife's grave while walking through a monsoon of some sort and tells her headstone that he's sorry for what he's about to do. Then he just starts peeing. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> he leaves his medal of honor on her headstone and kisses it goodbye. <laughs> By the awesome. way, the headstone is helpfully labeled as his wife because Michael Bay knows exactly how sharp the audience for his films are. <laughs> Next, we see a group of Marines storm a naval weapons depot with a really weirdly formatted sign. I don't think you guys saw that, but it says like <laughs> naval. It's like naval and depot are different font size than the weapons in the I middle of it. Like that, they, yeah. they, somebody made a naval depot sign and then like, oh, shit, we got to put weapons in there. And then it was like slightly <laughs> different. People aren't going to know what depots are. It just looked like yeah. a really cheap prop <laughs> that was hastily put together. Probably was. Um, uh, anyway, uh, they storm this depot set to the bland sound of generic Michael Bay action movie music. Hummel uses his security clearance to come through the front gate while his men rappel down into the ultra secure facility somehow, despite there not being anything for them to attach rappels to on the outside of the fences. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's part of building these types of facilities is making sure that there's no way to like come down. Come over it. Yeah. yeah. Over it, yeah. <clears throat> but it's at odds with cool action movie yeah. like setup of military guys rappelling into stuff. They always have to rappel into things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, they knock out the guards with some tranquil darts that sound like a shotgun and cause full-grown men to fly like six feet through the air. <laughs> Suddenly, a stone-cold Steve Austin impersonator shows up, sporting a double tranquilizer guns, and takes out a couple of guys in seconds flat. Can I get a hell yeah? Hell yeah! <laughs> I swear that Steve, Steve, Steve Austin guy gets killed like four times throughout the movie. Like, <laughs> it's just every time they need a goon on screen. I, I feel like that guy. guy is in a lot of movies just <laughs> as is. a random goon. <laughs> he, yeah. he is. It doesn't matter that in real life tranquilizer darts take more than a millisecond to take the effect. But the script writer puts his foot down and said, that's the bottom line because Stone Cold said so. <laughs> And it crushes a beer. <laughs> uh, like 20 more guards are taken out with apparently non-lethal force, even though I'm pretty sure a guard who fell three flights out of a tower <laughs> and the guy bashed in the face so hard he does a backflip will probably feel that in the morning. Let's give him the stone cold stunner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's great. He just like elbows the guy and he's... <laughs> <laughs> That's how physics work, man. <laughs> <laughs> the platoon finds some access cards and get into a facility, which I guess they hold the Triforce in based on the symbol on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> that's what they're keeping there. Um, they hand over the, the access wow. cards to Hummel, who waltzes in like he owns the place, and they steal 15 missiles filled with green gumballs of ne deadly nerve gas that one of the Marines immediately drops on the floor, killing him in seconds, while that actor you recognize from that one thing looks on from the other <laughs> side of the door. <laughs> no idea what that guy's name is, but I've seen him in like a, a dozen different things. things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, the green bath bomb turned, into a, turned him into a Cardassian. <laughs> The Star Trek kind, not the whores on TV. <laughs> <laughs> Bubbly skin. Oh, yeah, he had like all the little dots around yeah, the eyes. Skin turned all gray. And yeah. Deep cuts here. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, we cut to an FBI lab in Washington, D.C., where we see the greatest actor of his generation, or any generation for that matter, busy shooting targets to trigger a Rube Goldberg machine to serve Pee Wee Herman's breakfast. <laughs> I mean, to incinerate a hula, hula girl. <laughs> it's your tax dollars at work. <laughs> uh, Cage's character, Dr. Stanley Goodspeed. That's right. Someone wrote the name Stanley Goodspeed and thought, yeah, that's a great character name. <laughs> Receives a copy of the Beatles' first album on vinyl, which he's ridiculously overjoyed to get since he's a Beatle maniac. Yes, she's here. Bring it to me now. Thank you, Phil. What's that? Uh, I'm guessing that aspect of his character is vitally important since it's the first piece of info we <laughs> learn about him in the first 60 seconds of him being on screen. Maybe it'll show up again in the climax of the film or something, or maybe he'll just make an Elton John joke instead for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's never mentioned again. I guess he's listening to it when he's playing guitar. He's listening, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, and and uh, Cage is historically known as a huge Elvis fan, so I wonder if he had an issue with that. Suddenly an alarm sounds and the members of the lab spring into action to check out potential sarin gas in a wooden crate. Good, sp- Which I get, like, this thing just showed up and there's alarms going off. Like, they didn't get any kind of advance notice that they were bringing a crate full of sarin gas in. Yeah, you would think. <laughs> <laughs> it's an emergency rushed to the lab. I think from yeah. the airport, I think is what they said. Like it was on a cargo plane on its way somewhere. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yeah, they seized it somewhere. And, but you would think like they would get advanced just notice. hearing about it. Like as it walks through the door. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good speed suits up to help blow up an asteroid. Oh, wait, that's a different <laughs> movie. Uh, he and this dumpy bald trainee suit up and head into a steel chamber with a bottle of cockroaches. I have to assume the writers did the research and this is how the FBI actually does things. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, that's some <laughs> F- secure FBI facility. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Taking care of sarin gas. And I swear those suits they are wearing are some sci-fi prop left over it from someone. Like I feel like the, I've seen them in something yeah. else. The Armageddon suits, or maybe okay. they reused the Armageddon suits from or from this in Armageddon. <laughs> Armageddon. Yeah. yeah, that must have been it. Uh, they find some nudie mags, a gas mask, and a baby doll inside the crate, and the trainee, of course, triggers the mechanism inside the doll, releasing the gas. Just play with everything when you're <laughs> when you're yeah. trying to defuse a bomb. I uh, mean, his boss was just <laughs> shooting targets to trigger a Rube Goldberg machine, so. <laughs> Also, he's a middle-aged trainee. Doesn't yeah. really bode well. <laughs> Takes a long time well, to work up into those big government those roles. Big government yeah, roles. Anton Elchin wasn't born yet, or wasn't old enough <laughs> yet to fight him, I guess. Look at this uh, doll, old sport. <laughs> Uh, Stanley keeps his cool while telling Marvin to stab himself in the heart with a giant syringe filled with atropine as he disarms the doll filled with C4 as the gas eats away at their suits. Seems like a weird, like, just just throw everything into the scene at once. Like, you got corrosive gas and you need to somehow, somehow stabbing a hole through your suit protects you from From the corrosive gas eating your suit away and then also protects you from the corrosive gas that would somehow eat your flesh off yeah. because it's eating through the suit. Um, I have a, a, a quick fact uh, <laughs> that I'll, I'll talk about when Cage does this heart stabbing thing later on, spoilers in the film, um, about how atropine actually works and how <laughs> this situation would actually go down. But I wanted to mm-hmm. leave it until we talk about that one. All right. Uh, anyway, Marvin panics and refuses to stab himself in the heart, but he's saved in the nick of time <laughs> as Stanley disarms the bomb. <laughs> uh, so, like, I guess, did they ever talk about him being like a ordnance expert as well? Like, I don't remember them mentioning that. Like, he's all chemical stuff, I think but he also chemical he's apparently a bomb squad freak. guy and he knows yeah. how to like diffuse warheads <laughs> and stuff. Yeah, I think it just kind of like <laughs> comes with do. both because chemical <laughs> weapons were. <laughs> Probably at the time, so he'd have to know how to defuse. I guess that makes chemical sense. Weapon, I guess, yeah. but it seems like he's more of just a chemix, like f- chemist guy. Like he knows the chemistry of. Stuff, I mean, bombs also- are chemistry, baby. <laughs> True, <laughs> technically, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah I also like how they're like, disarms- there's enough C four in this doll to blow up the entire building. Yeah. So they evacuate this room. <laughs> that's, that's not how that works, bro. <laughs> yeah. Which is yeah, funny because like one room, <laughs> they have C four in this tiny doll. Um, and they say it would blow up like 
pretty much the whole building. Um, but then later on, we see Tuco Salamanca throw a C4 into the tunnel and it just like creates a little explosion. Yeah. So, yeah. Not, and that yeah. was way more oh. C4 in that thing. Yeah, it's it like a huge full. brick. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Adam Stanley listens to his Beatles record while poorly playing a guitar naked in his passing out yeah. chair. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Dorothy. I don't know why not. I <laughs> uh, guess he was expecting a martini glass of jelly beans. <laughs> it looked, looked really similar to his get up and <laughs> ghost writer. <laughs> yeah. There's a monkey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, his girlfriend Carla comes home and is not at all surprised to see him butt naked in the living room. So I'm guessing this is a regular occurrence in the Goodspeed <laughs> household. Uh, quick fact, Nicholas Cage and Michael Bay differed as to the reasoning behind <laughs> the early scene of Goodspeed naked with a guitar. Bay says it's because he knew Cage wanted to show off his body, except he's not like particularly not ripped really, or anything. He's he's not, and he's covered with the guitar. So Yeah, and he's covered yeah. with the guitar. <laughs> uh, so they just decided to get it out of the way up front. But Cage says he simply wanted to establish that the character was at home. So I guess he, Stanley would just be naked at home all the time. It's how we all uh, are at home. I don't know. I just sit around butt naked playing guitar all the time. <laughs> you know, after a day of, uh, you know, almost dying. Yeah, I mean, I guess we all got to be somehow. cleanse myself. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe his clothes got eaten away by the sarin gas. <laughs> the sarin gas. <laughs> she says she had an interesting day, and he says he had a terrifying day to, to, filled with exposition to set up a handful of scenes later in the movie. He says he can't understand why anyone would want to bring a child into this crazy, awful, shit-stained world, and she tells him that she's pregnant. But um. <laughs> 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 He responds with his best Owen Wilson. Wow. And asks her how she knows she's pregnant to which she produces a vial of blue liquid, which I guess is how pregnancy tests are done in over the top Michael Bay movie world. Then she went to the doctor. <laughs> what is, uh, I can't remember what Carla does for a living. Do we ever establish that? Does she ever get, I don't think she'd, I don't think they uh, say, I think it says or like maybe if she worked in a lab or something, cause he works, uh, chemical weapons expert maybe she works in a lab maybe that's why maybe they he chose made this. <laughs> maybe he made a homegrown pregnancy test in a vial and that's what she used <laughs> just as fun for fun then carla asks stanley to marry her in the living room while he's butt naked playing a guitar and he responds by saying hey hey whoa big mistake i mean <laughs> hey, hey whoa marriage police pull over as you do <laughs> whoa oh, marriage like police like another <laughs> other nick cage improv like yeah say something weird and geeky <laughs> <laughs> we cut to a tour guide leading a group on the movie's namesake the rock aka alcatraz in san francisco bay general hummel and his men happen to be in the tour group and this they slowly take over the former prison but not before hummel warns some kids to leave with their classmates quick fact while filming alcatraz was still open to the public and many visitors watched the movie being shot <laughs> It's so weird. <laughs> I wonder if like any of those people who were in that shot were actually just there for a tour and they were like, yeah. hey, come join this thing. <laughs> Sign these papers and then we'll film you for a little bit. Yeah. You're going to be stuck. Uh, that'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a ranger named Bob locks the tourists in their cells as part of the tour, but Hummel's men show up and tell Bob the tour is over. And since this is a Michael Bay movie, our old pal Token Blackman shows up for a second to just say, <laughs> what kind of then a few seconds later, we see Token Blackman's sister say, I got a goddamn gun. If I'd have known this was going to have another problem, my motherfucking gun. <laughs> oh, uh, boy. Hmm. You know, I, I can't, I'm not sure if it was like a Bruckheimer trope or if it was a Michael Bay trope, because I feel like Bruckheimer did this first. Like, just the comic <laughs> relief are the gay characters and the uh, characters yeah. of any race besides white. Um, but Michael Bay has used it nonstop since since his first film. Definitely uh, is showing its age. <laughs> it is. <laughs> in yeah. these films. Definitely. <laughs> we see some helicopters fly over San Francisco and some more soldiers, including Tuco Salamanca and Candyman himself, repel out of them to join Hommel and his team. Even though the helicopters <laughs> land a few minutes later. Yeah, you gotta have the repelling because it looks cool. <laughs> it looks, it looks cool. Badass, dude. They do it at least <clears throat> two other times, I think, in the movie. <laughs> at least. That I can think that I can 
<laughs> why? Why? Yeah, we'll get to it, yeah. I guess. But it's just like, uh, Michael Bay just has this walk weird over. <laughs> boner for military stuff and like yeah. doing cool military things, I guess. So I guess they're into showmanship. I don't know. Hubble <laughs> and his men set up a command center, load up the rockets and set up some surveillance gear to make sure no one sneaks onto the island. But they do it anyway. So whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I have Hubble a couple, tells- <laughs> couple questions about that because it's like. Uh, they're very selective of where there is surveillance gear. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> like, to take out the seals, yeah. they had surveillance up the ass. And then when they go where the rockets are, there's no surveillance at all, except no, for the guys, there's guys sitting there. there. I guess. Sometimes. I guess. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Hummel tells his men that they're now traitors and then compares himself to the founding fathers. Wanting to break free of the British to govern yourself, pointing sarin gas at innocent civilians to make a point. Same thing. He promises they'll all get a million dollars to live out their lives in a non-extradition country. Again, with the non-extradition country, MacGuffin. <laughs> he gives a passionate speech about how the lies about soldiers dying while on secret missions stops now, or he'll cause half the Bay Area to boil like lobsters and have their insides turn to mush like a true patriot. He calls the director of the FBI and lets him know that he has rockets filled with VX gas pointed at San Francisco and tells him he'll call back with his list of demands a few hours later. This is where one of my questions came in. Like these guys are he's relying on this guy's sense of patriotism, but also they're going to get a million dollars and never have set foot in the U S again, if they mm-hmm. do this. So that doesn't really make sense, but kind of was foreshadowing for the third act twist of it. So yeah, it sort of got resolved. <laughs> Just seems like about weird, the, right, like, as the motivation right at the beginning. <laughs> like, wait, this doesn't quite make sense. He's got a bunch of loyal soldiers mm-hmm. <laughs> who he's telling are doing their patriotic duty, but then by doing this, they'll never be able to be considered Americans again. Yeah, they'd <laughs> be traitors weird. forever, too. It's always funny, like, we talked about this on Con Air, but, like, couldn't they just shoot the helicopters down while they're heading to an <laughs> extradition-free country? <laughs> Why is that always a thing? <laughs> yeah. At a meeting in the Pentagon, we find out that Hummel is a highly decorated officer and a hero since he received the Congressional Medal of Jesus. <laughs> a four-star general snarkily talks to Hummel on a Zoom call, I guess, where Hummel demands benefits paid to 83 families of men who died under his command by transferring $100 million from some shady bank funded by illegal arms sales that I'm guessing were made by Yuri Orlov. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe Hummel is... Doctor or uh, General uh, Summer or whatever Southern, uh, Southern. Yeah, Southern, yeah, General, General Southern, yeah, Southern, <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, it's, all right right. it's Sutherland, but not quite. <laughs> uh, he he gives them forty hours to pay up, or he'll wipe out the bay. The FBI director says they shouldn't alert anyone since it'll cause a panic, and they say one rocket will kill sixty to seventy thousand. And if one teaspoon of the gas hits the floor, it's lethal up to a hundred feet, but in atmosphere it'll kill everything in an eight block radius. They make a plan to equip some jets with thermite, which I guess is the only way that will destroy the gas as a secondary measure. What's his first choice? Why none other other than Nick Cage and old man James Bond, of course. <laughs> Uh, early on in the film, General Patterson says that a teaspoon of the VX gas is lethal up to a hundred foot radius. But later on in the film, Goodspeed smashes an entire VX ball into a soldier's mouth and nothing happens to Mason, the hostages or anybody else on the island. Well, I think they were in a completely different. They were in the lower lighthouse, which is like away from everything. Like it doesn't Still. explain why it didn't immediately start melting. Yeah. Goodspeed's he, he makes skin. that speech about, well, if the winds change. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that was fucked. him just saying I trying to <laughs> psych out the guy, maybe. But anyway, uh, quick fact in the Pentagon scene, they say that VX was made to be resistant by napalm. However, in real life, VX gas is destroyed in the heat of napalm. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, maybe it's it wouldn't the, like the casing on the missiles would, would stop the heat or something. But, it. I mean, I don't, I don't know. know. Napalm some nasty shit. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why they couldn't just make up a fake chemical. I thought VX wasn't a real thing. Like, I think it just made up some. I think they just made up some fake thing. I think thing. it's because VX gas was in the news at the time. The general in charge asks the FBI director who his best chemical weapons expert is, and we cut to Stanley giving his wife the old good seed out on their balcony. <laughs> He gets a call in the middle of complimenting her pigtails, which is creepy. Uh, and in response to the phone ringing, he says, This isn't happening. This isn't happening. It was like the most awkward sex scene 
Number yeah. two to Deadfall. <laughs> yeah, Deadfall yeah. will always win, I think. But yeah, it was uh, weird. The answer, <laughs> the like, answer is patchy. no. It was a cre- and they're fully clothed. And they're fully clothed. <laughs> point out yeah. In a yeah, he was naked in the last <laughs> scene. <but laughs> no, he's fully clothed. And they're up on their roof. Like, yeah. uh, As you uh, do, you know, DC, <laughs> it's hard to see yeah. tops of roofs. That's their kink. <laughs> and there's like a bridge right across from them. <laughs> he answers the phone with little Stanley still poking his baby in the head. It says he'll meet some fellow FBI <laughs> agents downstairs in 10 minutes. He hangs up and tells Carla he has to go to San Francisco. And when she gets upset that he's leaving, he invites her to come with him. It, this their whole relationship is so stupid. Like, yeah. why, why does she get so upset with him when she knows he works for the FBI as a chemical weapons expert? And he's probably going to be called away at any point to go do dangerous she's a shit. Woman. And why is he okay with her going with him when he knows he's probably? I mean, he says it's going to be a training exercise, yeah. blah blah blah. But who knows? Maybe it's not. He almost just got blown up. Yeah, <laughs> like that, that day. That's my issue with it. Is like he j- he just went through this <laughs> horrifying situation. <laughs> yeah, but he's like, yeah, just come along. Like I, I get sent on these training missions all the time. So Everybody obviously knows that's you what can't this have is. Back to back bad things happen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think it's like why it's just because she's a woman in a Michael Bay movie. So she's yeah. irrational. But that's a hundred percent why she reacts that way is because that's how Michael Bay perceives women. <laughs> yeah. And as we just said, like she has no backstory. We don't no. flesh out her character at all. She's just <laughs> Nick Cage's girl who's having mm-hmm. a baby. Who's having a baby. That's about yeah. it. That's about all we get. <laughs> Uh, he, he says he's sure it's just a training exercise and then he agrees to marry her. Then she gets off his lap and we can see they're both fully clothed. (laughs) We cut to Nick's deadfall co-star and the default military guy of the (laughs) nineties, Michael Bean, who makes a plan to infiltrate the prison, but the catch is they need firsthand intelligence of the tunnel system under Alcatraz. Cause I guess a bunch of Navy SEALs couldn't figure out how to infiltrate a tunnel system if given enough. I guess they didn't have enough time. They only had yeah. what? And the blueprints have changed because they've done so many remodels yet. The guy that escaped, <laughs> what, 30 years ago 30 still years knows ago. it because it, down there hasn't changed at all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Anyways. And they have all this like image mapping with like sonar and shit. They're tracking them in real time. Yeah, they can't real map time. the tunnels out. Yeah. <laughs> Suddenly, legendary character actor Philip Baker Hall, a.k.a. Bookman from Seinfeld, (laughs) pipes up and says that he might know a guy. He and the FBI director tells us through exposition that once upon a time, an SAS British operative managed to escape from Alcatraz. I mean, he wouldn't have been SAS at the time if he's working for the intelligence. What? Right. He what? I said he wouldn't have been SAS at the time. Well, he would have been if he was undercover and they wouldn't. They even say that the, the British government dis- disavowed all knowledge of him when he was captured. So that would make sense if he was a double O agent. Uh, yeah. They wouldn't have any record of him. We cut to a long haired hippie, Sean Connery, rotting in a prison cell surrounded by Shakespeare books. Then to Stanley hopping on a private jet where he awkwardly tells the FBI director how into chemistry he is and how horrible VX gas can be. Just shove exposition in every time, mm-hmm. just just in case you forgot. <laughs> um, even though we we watched this happen like on screen, kill somebody. Like, like he's really awkward when he's talking to people about anything aside from what he's an expert in. And then as soon as he like talks about chemical stuff, he snaps into being super serious, which <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. you know I guess makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. <clears throat> He's also alerted that this isn't a training exercise, but I guess he decided not to tell his fiance uh, until hours later. Yeah. Or to have somebody tell her, which I guess he does eventually, but like, I don't know. Couldn't have called her from the plane. I, from what we know of her, though, she wouldn't listen. She'd be like, no, yeah, I'm still coming true. anyway. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> women. <laughs> <laughs> Can't just let the boys be boys. <laughs> yeah, it. Back in San Francisco, where everything is orange for some reason, Goodspeed meets up with his Raising Arizona co-star, William Forsythe, a.k.a. Agent Paxton, who alerts he and the FBI director that their mystery prisoner has arrived. FBI director Womack explains that the prisoner, John Mason, escaped Alcatraz (laughs) in 1963. But that information was never made public and the government made sure that any information about Mason disappeared from the world completely. (laughs) <laughs> Paxton tells Mason the situation at Alcatraz that they need his help and promises him pussy galore if he does. 
Mason <laughs> compares himself to Alchemenes, who was imprisoned by a king in ancient Greece. Stanley knows exactly what he's talking about because he's a huge dweeb, which perks <laughs> Momax's interest, so he sends him in to talk to Mason when Paxson's method of calling Mason pops and saying it'd be good for him to get out of jail while his penis still works doesn't elicit the response they're hoping for. <laughs> It's Good funny because like Womack like <laughs> tells him like that shit's not gonna work on this guy, and then he just <laughs> goes right to that. <laughs> yeah. Um Goodspeed introduces himself by saying hi ya! Or is it hi? <laughs> hi ya is a different movie. Yeah, that's a different hi fucking ya. Not hi ya. Awkwardly <laughs> Hi ya. <laughs> and awkwardly tells Mason his name, to which Mason says, but of course you are. Quick fact, in this scene in the interrogation room where FBI agent Stanley Goodspeed introduced himself to John Mason, John replies, but of course you are. This is exactly the same line he used when he met Plenty O'Toole in the casino scene in the Bond movie <laughs> Diamonds Are Forever in 1971. <laughs> Mason asks for coffee and Goodspeed says, no, I'm fine, thank you. So Mason says, oh, for me. Really off coming of me, off as coffee. a doofus. <laughs> <laughs> then Mason asks to have his cuffs taken off, and of course, Goodspeed obliges. He hands Mason a pardon, and when Mason drops some, la- or then Mason drops some Latin on him. Goodspeed knows exactly what he's saying, which leads Mason to say he's definitely not a field agent since he's an educated man. <laughs> burn. <laughs> yeah. Oh, burn. Mason agrees to the deal, but only if he can have a suite at the Fairmont Hotel so he can get a shave, a shower, a suit, and a vodka martini shaken, not stirred. (laughs) Goodspeed suggests a haircut as well, since he looks like he's headed to train and off to train a Highlander. (laughs) I wonder if like, so uh, when did Highlander happen? Because he had the long hair. I almost wonder if that was actually Sean Connery's hair at the time. It was early 90s, right? Yeah, something like like 92. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Goodspeed leaves and Mason uses a quarter Paxton tossed at him earlier to cut a hole in the glass separating the interrogation room from Womack after Womack rips up the pardon saying they were never going to release Mason no matter what the outcome was. Also, Mason calls Womack a piece of shit, so I'm guessing he knows how this is all going to end up anyway. <laughs> You know how you can just cut glass with quarters? (laughs) The quarter? (laughs) Cut a double-sided mirror that's soundproof glass they use for interrogating. The FBI uses for interrogating people. (laughs) And then just elbow it through. Works every time. (laughs) Try it. Try it next time. Just try it. Uh, next, we see Goodspeed calling Carla while escorting Mason to the Fairmont to warn her not to come to San Francisco. But she answers and says, like hell, I'm not coming. So I guess her chemical weapons expert future husband warning her not to go somewhere. He was just taken in an emergency fashion the day after nearly dying wasn't a clear indicator that she'll be in danger if she shows up. <laughs> <laughs> Mason then creepily leans forward and asks. Who's Carla? Why don't you want her to come to San Francisco? And when Goodspeed says he doesn't need to know, Mason barks at him. Which is a weirdly continuing trend we've discovered in these cage movies that people like to bark at him (laughs) out of nowhere. I almost wonder, like, is that where the barking came from in Bringing Out the Dead? Was they were like, oh, let's homage The Rock. (laughs) Act two. It's about time we had some conflict, wouldn't you say? At the Fairmont, Goodspeed asks for a gun since he left his in his sock drawer at home. So a guy calls him a chemical freak. Uh, Patrick, uh, as a resident of the Bay Area, I'm sure you can attest there are a lot of chemical freaks in the city. And I, I would bet you can understand the hostility here. Yeah, lots of, uh, lots of fentanyl. <laughs> <laughs> fentanyl, crack heroin chemicals heroin. chemicals <laughs> good speed says he's a chemical super freak actually but he still needs a gun so the guy gives him his gun it kind of seems like the actual fbi field agent would need it more but uh you know what the fuck do i know <laughs> i don't know does he have like a backup somewhere he just probably the- in his ankle if 90s <laughs> like they don't, they don't, they, yeah. anything. <laughs> ankle holster <laughs> they don't have an extra gun anywhere they could give him the guy gives yeah. him his own his own gun his, is gun. his issued gun. Yeah, exactly. Just hands it over. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, right. Isn't that registered to him? So if anybody, yes. if you never give it up to somebody else. Yes. Logic in these, uh, <laughs> yeah. these Michael Bay movies. Movies. <laughs> yeah. 
We see Mason washing his succulent Scottish body while horribly singing the 60s tune in San Francisco. You all know it. If you're going to San Francisco, be sure to wear flowers in your hair. <laughs> That's exactly how he sounds when he sings it. <laughs> I know. He's not, not even, even like trying at all. <laughs> Just like he never tries to not do his Scottish accent. He's yeah. never going to actually try to sing. <laughs> Meanwhile, Mason calls for room service and pulls an inch-long piece of rope from the wall, but I guess the agents watching him shower didn't notice that. They were too busy fapping. <laughs> I know I was. Yeah, they don't hear him talking to room service. They were just overhearing yeah. him singing. Sing. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Why is there a phone right next to the bathroom? <laughs> you never know when you're going to need to call room service. <laughs> Why do they let him have access to a phone? Exactly. You would think so the FBI would go into that room and make sure that it was completely cleared of anything mm -hmm. that he could use right. to escape. This is like no. the same problem with the U.S. Marshals and Con Air. They're just making the FBI <laughs> seem like a bunch of idiots. The idiots, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Rockheimerism. The stylist shows up to cut Mason's hair, and since this is a 90s action movie, he's a gay caricature. Or a Paul Schrader movie. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, was it the same guy? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Dying of the Light. It's the blueprint for <laughs> Dying of the Light. Schrader saw he's like, one of these days I'm going to have that guy in my film. <laughs> he's going to check out Anton Yelchin's ass. <laughs> it's going to be hot. <laughs> now, if you're playing at home, we're already only an Asian driving badly away from Brock Heimer <laughs> stereotype bingo. <laughs> Outside, Mason gets his haircut on the balcony while wearing his new suit for some reason. Um, just, they didn't even cover it all the way with the apron. So <laughs> he's in for a real itchy day. <laughs> While this is going on, the snacks that Mason ordered show up, distracting pretty much every FBI guy who aren't worried about watching him since Mason's an old man. And mind you, the snacks are lobster, <laughs> champagne, oysters, full, full banquet, full, <laughs> yeah, seafood banquet. <laughs> Just bring me everything you have on the menu. <laughs> <laughs> on the balcony, Mason asks Womack why he should trust him 10 seconds before tying the rope he found earlier, which is now like 10 feet long magically, around <laughs> Womack's wrist and throwing him over the balcony. <laughs> now, quick fact, and this should be obvious to anybody who has a brain in their head. When John Mason loops the rope around FBI Director Romack's wrist and throws him over the balcony, the length of the drop and Romack's weight would have produced enough velocity to tear Romack's arm from its shoulder. It's exactly the same as those who've been hung incorrectly and subsequently decapitated. <laughs> That would have been cool, though, you know? Yeah, <laughs> Womack's <laughs> arm just flies off. Oh, shit. I, I didn't, oh, guess I didn't do that. <laughs> guess I'm a little out of touch. I'm guessing Whoops. it at least dislocates his arm because he's got a sling for the rest of the yeah. movie. So yeah, it, it would have definitely kind of dislocated his fucking arm. It would have been a lot cooler, though, if his arm just ripped off and you <laughs> just watch him off. Oh. Balls oh, just the arm dangling. <laughs> Oh, shit. <laughs> Freeze, mister. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let me bring his arm back up so he has something to bury. <laughs> I guess that costs an arm and a leg. <laughs> <coughs> oh, God. Pity. <laughs> Goodspeed's reaction is to say, Freeze, mister. And pull the gun he just got on him. Mason tells him to drop the gun or he'll drop Womack, and Goodspeed says, You will not. In a very cagey way. It's more like, <laughs> You will not. <laughs> this is like a blueprint for all his cagey action dialogue in the future. Like he's I think really they were going for like here. him being just really scared and out of his element in that scene, yeah. but it's just a really weird delivery on everything he says. <laughs> The whole time this is going on, the FBI guys don't hear a thing, and they only notice after Mason ties the rope to a chair and Goodspeed screams for help. They come to help, and Goodspeed takes off after Mason to the same music from Pirates of the Caribbean for some reason, while Mason takes the elevator with the gay hairstylist who tells him he just wants to know if Mason is happy with his haircut. Hilarious. Just hilarious. Uh, yeah, you can tell this is something that... <clears throat> Brooke, or not Brookheimer. Zimmer recycled a few years later. <laughs> yeah. 
Hey, it's I mean, a pretty it good action movie. It sounded exactly music. the same, right? It was yeah, like the yeah. exact it, same. It's slightly it's, different. It's like if you're trying to do a royalty free version of yeah, it, like, just <laughs> to not catch copyright strikes. Yeah. <laughs> We see a fat guy in a wig make his way down an escalator, kick it over some waiters. Oh, wait, that's actually Sean, or- Sean Connery's stunt double. <laughs> Mason makes his way through the kitchen and is yelled at by an Asian guy. He's not driving, but, you know, I'm still going to call bingo on that one. <laughs> Eventually, Mason punches Goodspeed in the face before stealing some Eastern European guy's Hummer outside. Uh, bonus points German. for Brockheimer bingo here. He was a German guy. I think they just they just called him like Eastern European or I'm pretty sure he calls him and yells at him in German later on. Is he? Okay. (laughs) Yeah. I I couldn't tell over the shitty music and (laughs) (laughs) motion sick cuts and camera shakes. This is this this chase scene. Oh my god. (laughs) It's awful. (laughs) <laughs> Meanwhile, Goodspeed steals a Ferrari and joins the chase, which seems to have been shakily filmed by a kid with ADHD and Parkinson's. <laughs> like, how do you how do you make a boring chase scene that <laughs> usable? You just zoom shake the in camera on, and zoom on in uh, William Forsythe's mm-hmm. face. You shake the camera like crazy. God, I was Especially I in was San Francisco, which has like some that. really unique. Hills and Hills vistas, and, and yeah. you can do some really cool shots. They even mentioned he's going like, what did they say, 70, 70 miles an hour? Yeah, 70 miles an like, hour. Anybody try to go 70 miles an hour anywhere in <laughs> inside San Francisco? You would think if you were making an action sequence in San Francisco, driving a uh, chase scene, you would reference bullet at some point. <laughs> uh, no, it's just... <laughs> Shake the camera as much as you possibly can. Zoom in on people's faces for no reason. It probably <laughs> sounded a lot better on paper, and then when they went to film it, it just didn't. Something I, didn't work, and then yeah. they had to have that editor guy turn it into something watchable. Yeah, yeah. It, it requires a ton of permits to film in San Francisco, uh, especially in these really expensive, affluent neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. Um, so I get it. <clears throat> I also want to point out that like no. Until the very end of this chase scene, there's like no damage on either one of the vehicles on the Hummer <laughs> yeah, or the Ferrari after the Hummer like smashes through a beetle and through a bunch of water <laughs> on a water yeah. truck and the Ferrari hits at least two cars and a telephone pole. <laughs> there's Oh yeah, we get no damage on them. We get into that. And it's a Hummer, way. dude. I mean, come on. It's, it's a Hummer. It's Hummer it's <laughs> Unless they're the US Army in there over in Iraq. <laughs> Michael Bay loves loves no, Hummers sorry. and Ferraris. <laughs> Those are like his go-to in car yeah, chases. Really are. Or Porsches. <laughs> hey man, if you got the budget to rent a Ferrari, you're gonna put a Ferrari in your movie. <laughs> <laughs> Mason slams into every goddamn car in San Francisco, including a 60s love bug. Because those things are just everywhere in San Francisco. <laughs> a water truck, a parking meter truck, and eventually a telephone pole to stop the cops pursuing him. All of which explode on impact because, of course they do. It's Michael Bay. <laughs> it's a pretty exciting chase scene. If you can manage not to get seasick, which I couldn't, and get over the <laughs> unnecessary whip zooms on William Forsyth's face, which... I mean, he's a good looking guy, but do we really need all that? <laughs> It's over the top. He's not even involved in the chase. I know. I'm like, why do they keep going back to him all the time? <laughs> he's on the radio. He's, he's directing <laughs> cops. To I, do I, I guess they they probably paid him a lot of money, so they had to get their money's worth out of it. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny. There's always these kind of like b- bigger stars in these secondary roles. That, yeah, like, you could you could have just probably just kept it all Womack, and not yeah, not put Womack, Forsyth in yeah. there, but or Cusack. <laughs> Cusack. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Good speed, who doesn't live in San Francisco, knows exactly how to cut Mason off while the cops, who do live in San Francisco, just stop in the street. So they're out of the chase completely. <laughs> Good speed drives the Ferrari through a garage and out a window, totaling it. No, wait, it's completely fine. And he catches right up to Mason, who calls information on the Humvee's car phone to find out where someone named Jane Angelou lives. Which also, he doesn't seem that phased by a car phone for a guy who's been in prison for 30 years. But... He was I James Bond. Bond, he? Bond had car phones. So. He had yeah. car phones. Hey, he had exploding watches, mm-hmm. pens. Yeah. Oh, Q, I see you've been up to your old tricks like, in America. Yeah. Oh, these are common now. <laughs> <laughs> then Mason drives down a steep hill and 
almost runs over an old lady and hits a cable car, knocking it off the rails, and Goodspeed hits a bunch of parking meters, which destroy his windshield, but in the next scene, it's totally fine. And the cable car hits a truck and explodes, and there's fire everywhere, and it flies in the air about like 15 feet in slow motion, and it skids down the hill, so Goodspeed has to shoot his airbag to get out of the car since he's trapped, and the cable car hits some parked cars and destroys the Ferrari, so Nick Cage slow-mo stands up into frame and punches a kid off a dirt bike, and he rides around San Francisco, and Token Black Dad says, Where's that son of a bitch at? I'm gonna hunt him down! That motherfucker ain't safe anywhere! <laughs> God, Jesus. Another token token blackman's family member showing up (laughs) (laughs) it's the trolley driver (laughs) yes the trolley driver who like standing behind the trolley that just blew up but it's not somehow he's not in it he was in it yeah and then all of a sudden he's fine i guess he bailed out while it was falling down a hill i I mean all those other people people like falling out out of it and rolling down the hill (laughs) that old old guy is just gonna jump out of it and be fine Favorite part that. of that is just him like shooting, shooting the airbag, the air sort bag. of, but like they kind of cut <laughs> they away. Cut, they cut they do away weird cuts so you can't it. tell what he's doing, but like he pulls his gun out and, <laughs> and then he's out of the car. So it's like he yeah. shot his way out. It's the only way you can get out, you know? Yeah. I'm guessing the editor was like, this is too fucking stupid. Yeah. Because um, like, he would have fucking <laughs> killed himself. That bullet would have ricocheted off the fucking <laughs> yeah. wheel, the steering wheel, and shot him in the fucking head. And then you get the Michael Bay famous slow mo stand up whip around. Yeah, no fucking reason. Uh, yeah, stand into frame shots, man. God, Those are his things. <laughs> and then he steals a bike, yeah. <laughs> motorbike though, so we don't get to watch him. Ride yeah, like yeah. he can actually I ride do, one of those. I do <laughs> love that when he's riding it, they do like cut, and it's totally not Nick Cage. <laughs> <laughs> Off from yeah. a side shot, it's his stunt double, and it looks the nothing face like it. <laughs> a couple of shots like that in there. Yeah. That are- Godspeed calls the bald doofus we saw earlier and asks him to look up info about Mason. But of course, there's no info since he was wiped from history. Uh, not sure why that guy was the person he decided to call, but I guess we'd have to pay a different <laughs> actor if he called someone else who wasn't introduced as a trainee. Right. Yeah. And why would this guy in the chemical weapons lab at the FBI have clearance to look up prisoner transfers from 30 years ago? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, don't, I, I mean, don't. I guess he. I guess he would. They'd be investigating people as part of the chemical thing. If Maybe they were trying to trace uh, suspects and stuff. I mean, he. I don't know why the trainee. Why don't you just call his boss or somebody who actually <laughs> yeah. knows how to do their job? Because <laughs> his boss won't tell him anything. Well, Mac. I mean, I well, guess Marvin, the the bald guy, needed more <laughs> lines so that he wouldn't. Yeah. Uh, be wasted on the the amount of money they had to give him. <laughs> we're paying him. We're paying him scale. We gotta we gotta get something yeah, out of it. It was in the same set. They probably just filmed it when they filmed yeah. the other yeah. scene. <laughs> Eventually, the bald guy finds a record with no name on it, but uh, has a next to kin with the name Jade Angelou, which definitely seems like something they redacted. <laughs> they would have redacted, given the fact that they wiped him off. But you know what? <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's got to be able to find Mason. So, also, this record is from like 1976 somehow. It still has her current address on it, <laughs> which leads Godspeed to stop out in front of her car, uh, which, which leads He's calling Goodspeed. him Godspeed. I know <laughs> it's foreshadowing. It's foreshadowing. <laughs> also, this record from 1976 somehow has her current address on it. So Goodspeed stops out in front and tries to be inconspicuous on a loud as hell dirt bike. <laughs> He follows Jane and a friend to the Palace of Fine Arts where he sees that she's meeting with Mason. Turns out she's his daughter and they have a nice chit chat about him never being there for her since he was in prison for her whole life. But he wants to reconnect since she's almost the only evidence that he exists. Good speed calls in the feds, but it's nice enough to wait till Mason is finished and pretends that Mason is helping the FBI resolve a dangerous situation so as not to make his daughter think even less of him. Mason thanks him and Goodspeed says he was almost killed twice. His jaw hurts like hell. What do you say we cut the chit chat a hole? Then we'll weird make- tonal uh, shift from him doing yeah. him a solid in the same scene with his daughter. <laughs> He's just unstable. I, I think I like the fact that he doesn't know how to control his emotions and he does have like these <laughs> random burst like that like the butthole and all that shit yeah i think this is kind of the moment where mason decides that uh good speed isn't that bad of a guy yeah decides to to help him eventually you know yeah 
after he has to be prodded to help him like 20 times after this. Then Womack shows up and calls Mason a cocksucker who should rot in jail for the rest of his life. So I guess destroying half San Francisco to meet your long lost daughter has its consequences. <laughs> Lucky that she, nor her mom, ever moved in all those years, but I guess with the cost of living in San Francisco, you'd be a fool to walk away from that kind of locked-in rent thanks to rent control. See, some people who are still paying like $600 a month for their apartments because they got locked into the... Uh, and they're, they're still alive. Yeah, they're <laughs> yeah. still alive. And, yeah. yeah. It can only increase a certain amount, you know, after a certain amount of time, so... Smart. I wouldn't walk away from that house either. Beautiful no. house in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. You know how much that yeah. thing's worth? Saw a place that was like basically just a little closet in between two houses that sold for like a million dollars because somebody wanted to build like a tiny home in in the middle there. Whoa. San Francisco's ridiculously expensive. We cut to a dimly lit warehouse on the base of San Francisco Bay that the FBI are using as a makeshift control center. Mason, surprisingly, isn't back in prison and instead explains to Joe from Deadfall, Michael Bean's best known role, everybody knows, (laughs) how the tunnel system is laid out under Alcatraz. He says he remembers the exact route he took to escape, but says he won't be able to show them on the map as we see later. It's basically a fun park under Alcatraz, so he'll show them <laughs> once they're inside. Womack says there's no way in hell he's letting Mason go along, but reluctantly agrees when he realizes it might be the, their only shot at stopping the other half of San Francisco that wasn't destroyed during Mason's car chase from being wiped out by VX gas. <laughs> Goodspeed tells Michael Bean, a.k.a. Commander Anderson, where the poison is on the island, thanks to infrared surveillance photos that apparently missed three rockets. And Anderson (laughs) suggests he come along since there's no time for Goodspeed to teach his men how to disarm them. And he says, (laughs) the Joker's wild, baby. (laughs) (laughs) Mama. (laughs) Mama. Mama. (laughs) It's a good point, though, like... Why couldn't they have used those infrared images to figure out how to get into the prison? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, why couldn't they have brought in just a dummy warhead and have good speed to show the seals how to disarm it? There's no, no time. time. It looks, no time, it man. looks no like time. he did it. He did it with a screwdriver. Like pulls it out. Just pulled pulls a chip out, out a chip. Puts it back in. <laughs> really no tough. You think they These highly trained seals <laughs> don't have the, don't have the capability. But they have time to set up the experimental napalm stuff and load that onto <laughs> a bunch of, jets to use later (laughs) yeah (laughs) it's a michael bay movie it's like why would you train astronauts to be oil drillers when you could just send oil drillers up in his face and make them astronauts (laughs) exactly (laughs) exactly quick fact some of the navy seals in the movie were played by real navy seals michael bean who played navy seals or some variation thereof on multiple occasions apparently grew unsure of himself while acting for the first time here against real seals he told michael bay he was freezing up pretending to be the leader in front of them as well as in sean connery's presence pretty funny can't say i blame him yeah, yeah. you know what's funny though is like <laughs> like like the seal community jokingly uh says that he's like an honorary seal because of how many times he's played Navy <laughs> seals. How many times? Yeah, I'm sure a lot of them were Navy pretty seals, with him right? Yeah. Who's in that? Um, Which one? Navy seals. Wasn't yeah, he in that? With Charlie Sheen. Yep. Yeah. And then the rock. Um, there was another, I mean, he, he was a Marine a in, um, uh, aliens. Yeah. He was in aliens. Um, <laughs> basically space. He was a space, space seals. Yeah. Space, space seals. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's played a seal, I think, yeah. like three or four times. Yeah. So they joke like he's honorary seal, <laughs> which is well, actually so another fun quick fact is one of the seals in uh, real seals in the scene was actually like one of the founders of SEAL Team Six. Well, like he got recruited to be one of the, the first people in that organization. And he then also uh, helped like <laughs> coordinate stunts for Con Air, apparently. <laughs> Guess Brockheimer liked him. And Osama bin Laden didn't. <laughs> Damn it. Now we have to put up a fun fact about Osama bin Laden on the stupid YouTube video. Or we'll get flagged <laughs> as misinformation. <laughs> what, that he was killed by SEAL Team 6? I think everybody knows that. Yeah. Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> Just like they landed on the moon. Allegedly. All right. Back to the show. Living with GW in Texas somewhere. <laughs> That's a buddy <laughs> living, living on his, his <laughs> ranch. They're going to do somewhere. like an odd couple parody of that. <laughs> Osama. <laughs> all right. You drink all the milk. 
<laughs> Did you record over my Sesame Streets? <laughs> so looking forward to seeing what Ernie was going to learn this week. <laughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> <sighs> okay. <clears throat> Why is there a goat in the living room? <laughs> 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 <sighs> you watching those Japanese sex cartoons again? Because <laughs> I told you not to watch those without me. <laughs> Ooh, okay. They ask, they ask if he's ever been in combat, and he says, define combat. And, that, and Extra gets his trailer moment by saying, an incursion underwater to retake an impregnable fortress held by an elite team of U.S. Marines in possession of 81 hostages and 15 guided missiles loaded with VX poison gas. So he says, oh, in that case, uh, then no, sir. And pukes in the bathroom for a bit. <laughs> so wait, there are 15 rockets? He yes. disarms like three. <laughs> he, he disarms, he disarms 12 in the morgue before anybody notices that those yeah. guys were, oh, right. you know, just like right. brutally uh, shot with launch. machine so guns. So they put 12 yeah. in the morgue and then three just in other. Yeah, places. three in the actual launch, like uh, ready to launch. And the oh, other okay. ones were in the morgue. Because you got to keep them cold. Why the hell the morgue is chilled? <laughs> why is it still power prison it still that hasn't been in use for <laughs> 40 years, 30 years at that point? Yeah. <laughs> the rest of it's a fucking ruin. Like the outside. <laughs> yeah. Why is the furnace running too? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> why is there a mine shaft? God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Paxton pops in to tell him they're all rooting on him and good luck. Wait, no, that's a different movie. <laughs> <laughs> Baxter pops in to tell him he looks like shit. It's not very nice. And Goodspeed says, <laughs> My stomach's doing hula hoops around my ass. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as, as you do. I like that expression. I want to use that. <laughs> <laughs> Baxter gives him a pep talk by saying he was trained for this, and he has the best SEAL team in the country backing him up. Spoilers. They turn out not to be that great. <laughs> Paxton tells him he'll send for Clara. So <clears throat> sorry, Paxton Carla. tells him, Clara. Paxton tells him he'll send for Clara so she can be close <laughs> to ground. <scene. laughs> Clara, that's the name. That's Carla. Clara. Clara. It's not Dostoevsky. Kind of, it's a little easier. Clara. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> Paxton tells him he'll send for Clark. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Kevin. Her name Paxton is Kevin. tells him he'll send for Carla so he can be closer so she can be oh my god <laughs> Paxton tells him he'll send for Carla so she can be closer to ground zero rather than be on a flight back home I guess yeah, I didn't say, bring her closer yeah mm. same logic you couldn't as just Con say Air. hey like I would have just been like okay just just like arrest her or something I don't know yeah. anything just get her out of here and I can explain later why mm -hmm. you know she was because I know they can't tell her why she can't show up but like yeah. do, do something to keep something. her out of keep her get safe her with those tranks we have to <laughs> have those reaction shots where she racks to the president on the phone <laughs> yeah somehow <laughs> mm -hmm. maybe he's on the loudspeaker at that FBI control center but could be <laughs> There has to be some emotional reaction sure. in every scene, and she's the the face of, you know, caring Audience? for for good speed. Uh -huh. Yes, I guess he, he can't just be a good person who doesn't want seventy thousand people to die in San Francisco. He's got to care about his wife, yeah. fiance, <laughs> and unborn it. child. Inside Alcatraz, Hummel receives word that there's an issue transferring him the money, which he obviously knows is their way of buying time so he doubles down and says in 17 hours he'll destroy the city and when the white house staff finds out the thermite plasma option of incinerating the island might not work they green light the seals incursion to the island anderson and the seal team along with mason and goodspeed who i guess didn't get the memo that everybody else was going to be wearing <laughs> face paint tonight <laughs> hop on some helicopters where goodspeed gets some flares to signal when the when the threat is neutralized a needle with atrophine in it as foreshadowing earlier which we talked about a little bit we'll get into that later and mason gets some lighter fluid and matches for no discernible reason other than to use it to roast a guy later also three washers but those oh are, that's oh, right yeah three washers <clears throat> maybe in case you needed to break another window <laughs> yeah Just, like why do i hear you're a little bit of a macgyver <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's kind of what i got there going with here we'll just yeah. give you some random some shit random you can shit. Cool stuff with it yeah 
I really want to see the scene of like Mason and Goodspeed showing up. <laughs> hey, I don't know where you're painting our faces. <laughs> <laughs> you're supposed to be covert in the water. <laughs> yeah, why do you have like grass stripes on your face? We're not going anywhere. There's this no is in Vietnam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sewers, man. You know, you gotta <laughs> smear shit on their faces. So <laughs> they blend in. <laughs> <laughs> Two of the three helicopters head to Alcatraz while the other drops below radar and the team jumps out of the helicopter with Thunderball mini submarines. This is a homage? A coincidence, maybe? Or is this really the James Bond universe? You decide. Why don't huh? they just take submersibles all the time? Well, yeah, I mean, you would have just... <laughs> Try and probably, come in covert. Why, why you, fly over with hop, yeah. coppers, choppers at all? Which alerts that... Anyway, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll say, so from the shore of San Francisco to Alcatraz, it, it's, it's like it's, a mile, maybe. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> actually, just watch the Unsolved Mysteries where they had a guy swim from Alcatraz to the shore to see if those guys who did it back in the 60s could have survived or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it's like right there. It's it's not that far. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but like the currents and then like the gray white. Yeah, the like, currents are bad. But if you had those Thunderball cold. submarines, you'd be yeah, fine. Yeah, those, no, for the SEALs, it'd be fine because they had the powered <laughs> subs and then they had the, yeah. Yeah, it'd be like a 15-minute scuba thing to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, whatever. They got anyway. a helicopter budget <clears throat> and they got to use it, goddammit. <laughs> show those also, there's off, another man. shot of people rappelling uh, in here once they... <laughs> The choppers are coming in. These guys repel off like some of me, uh, Hummel's yeah. guys repel off <laughs> of the White House yeah. or something for no reason at all. <laughs> Hummel I mean, exactly. They, they had oh, to sorry. have those like uh, little exposition moments on the helicopter. I feel like that's why this is in here. But yeah, yeah. it doesn't make any sense for a covert mission to yeah, alert no, you're, them you're, that you're coming. They're right on the water in that warehouse. You would just <laughs> insert there. Yeah. What's or, funny, you know, is, take uh, boats or something that's a little quieter than three choppers. Yeah. So if they yeah, don't want to so use yeah, the, your way. But I mean, you're, yeah. you're, 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 you're scuba diving in. So no, you would just insert right there. <laughs> yeah. Take the SVDs in. It's hey, funny. everybody knows that seals can't scuba dive all that well. <laughs> <laughs> What's funny is if you live in the Bay Area, you can tell that that was in Oakland where they were at. So they take off from somewhere around Oakland, fly over Drop oh, really? in instead of going from the <laughs> FBI warehouse that they were all set That's up in hilarious. across. I'm guessing maybe <laughs> because they thought, you know, Hummel and his men would be watching them from there or something. Right. Like they, they know exactly know where, the, where they, <laughs> the FBI had. Yeah, yeah, they know be. where the warehouse <laughs> orders. <laughs> Triangulated <laughs> their comms or something. <laughs> All the reason why you just go completely submersible and yeah, yes. you, gotta be, you yeah. wouldn't be able to see anything of them. Exactly. <laughs> Anyways, Hummel knows exactly what's going on and sends his men to patrol the perimeter of the island while the seals make their way to a small opening underwater, which leads to a cistern. Cistern. Yes, that that is that is. That no, word. I know. I, I but I'm just like, OK, that, that's, all right. Why is there a cistern there? That's, yeah, that's yeah. I don't, why is there the freaking like <laughs> the whole <laughs> underground from the Temple of Doom underneath the <laughs> dress? I don't know. Uh, Anderson is pissed that Mason led them to a room with no exit, but he stares at a furnace that has like no reason to be operating right now. <laughs> he says he memorized the timing of the flames and wheels spinning that don't seem to have anything to do with the function of a furnace, but whatever. <laughs> Looks cool. Yeah. Quick fact. Sir Sean Connery wanted the water heated to 90 degrees for those in the interior sequences after they gained entry. But after the crew caught the stomach flu within a few hours of each other, the doctor identified the water as a big incubator. Really? <laughs> That's what? <laughs> yeah. So they all got stomach flu from the water? Or- from the 90 degree water, like with bacteria in it? Interesting. So they didn't use fresh water. They just heated some fucking nasty water. They <laughs> yeah, what? Just, just pulled some uh, water out Piped of the bay. Piped it in from the ocean. Yeah, <laughs> yeah probably. <laughs> For <Jesus> authenticity. <laughs> they all got dysentery. I mean, 90 degrees. Bacteria <clears throat> loves that shit. That's mm-hmm. prime bacterial stew. Next to the scene stolen directly from Galaxy Quest, Mason rolls under the furnace like his boy Indiana Jones, while Dr. Cox from Scrubs and the Marines on the island look for signs of the seals. Moments later, Mason opens a door leading into the prison and says the iconic line. Welcome to the rock. 
I don't know about you guys, but every time that line happens, I cheer louder than when Captain America picked up Thor's hammer. <laughs> Rocks my hammer, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I always think of, uh, I can't remember, is like John McGinty or or something like that, the guy who plays that character. um, Cox. Who who plays, he's Dr. Cox in Scrubs. I feel like that's his most well-known role, but I always think of him from Platoon because he was like, oh yeah, he's he's got a bad feeling about this. (laughs) Yeah. So that's probably why he got this job because he was in Platoon. He's in a lot of like army roles. (laughs) Yeah, he was in a lot of military stuff back in the day. Before he got Scrubs. Before, yeah, Scrubs kind of changed his whole career. Oh, yeah. No, I noticed he didn't really, like, I don't know, he didn't go on to any big roles afterwards. Uh, but. After you make Scrubs money, I don't think you really need to. I mean, look yeah, at the rest of the cast. The rest of the cast kind of pick, they pick and choose what they do. Zach Braff does a lot of writing and directing now, I guess. Mm. A lot of more indie stuff. And yeah, I hope they get good residuals for Scrubs. <laughs> oh, God, That's I'm sure they do. That was like prime, that was like prime sitcom money time. Yeah. Mason leads the seals to a tunnel where we see him grinding. I'm sorry. (laughs) That was just my fantasy. (laughs) Mason leads the seals to a tunnel where we see him grinning like a schoolgirl. Goodspeed asks if he's enjoying this harrowing adventure. And Mason said, Oh, it's certainly more enjoyable than my average day. Reading philosophy, avoiding gang rape in the washrooms. Though it's less of a problem these days. Maybe I'm losing my sex appeal. (laughs) <laughs> I can tell you, these days. <laughs> Sean Connery in 1996 had not lost any of his sex appeal. Even <laughs> yeah. a 60 year old man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> this is really hard to write this thing with one hand. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, Tuka Sakamanka. Oh, Suddenly, Tuko Salamanca <laughs> detects seismic activity in one of the storm greets. Take, take, take. <laughs> I didn't even know that's who that was. I didn't even catch yeah. that. He was uh, also one of those guys. That was like sweet a, ass like, top knot. In this yeah, one. his uh, man bun. Yeah, he was also. Yeah, a I, mean, I can like, see it now stuff. that he mentioned it, but I did not even notice it at the time. You, you and his voice never changed. It's always been the same. <laughs> yeah. The first time I ever saw him in anything was X Files, so I always think of him as the Chupacabra. <laughs> <laughs> He's the Chupacabra. <laughs> He's yeah. the Chupacabra in the X Files. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> Spoilers for that episode of He's the, the Chupa- X Files from 1996 or whatever. That, that's, that's just where Vince Gilligan got all his actors <laughs> from X Files. <laughs> yeah, Gilligan really did. Yeah. Like he just kind of pulled from yeah. X Files. Yeah. Like Brian Cranston was really good in that episode of X Files. Let's bring him in. Oh, and yeah. the guy who plays who I want to play Tuco was really good in that episode of X Files. Let's bring him in. <laughs> Tuco Cabra. I'm pretty sure. Uh, <laughs> pretty sure Skyler was in an episode as well. But, <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, yeah. So the Marines make their way to the SEAL team. The SEALs make their way to a shower room where they trigger a motion sensor. And after thinking they've disarmed the device, they tell Mason and Goodspeed to sit tight while they head up, but uh, are met by an ambush. That motion sensor was really confusing to me, like how they disarm it. Like they, yeah. It's got a laser pointed at a ball with a spring in it, and they redirect the laser back at itself, which somehow doesn't and just push the it thing, over, and, even mm. though they move the entire laser around. And then they move this motion sensor, which sets off the sensor anyway. So what was the point of the laser? They say something in the, uh, in the, um, when they're setting those up that like nobody knows about these things and yeah, they're like okay. seismic, uh, triggered. Yeah. So any so kind of like movement. It's to make you think the laser is the trip wire, the trigger, but it's, but it's actually it's, the sensor, okay. which I, that makes sense. I feel like is more realistic than the laser. <clears throat> it feels like they reverse wrote that scene. Like they were like, we need a way for the seals to trip an alarm coming in, but the seals are so good. They wouldn't trip an alarm coming in. So we need to have alarm that they think they disarmed, yeah. but then the alarm's actually got to go off anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep. You'd think they would know all about that stuff since they're, you know, the seals. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. doesn't seem like the Marines would know about something before the seals would know yeah. about it. And you assume like these are seal team six guys since they're the best of the best uh, and they're operating within the United States, which is illegal. <clears throat> and they're led by Michael Bean. Okay. Fuck yeah. It's the ultimate <laughs> vote of confidence. <laughs> Sorry, I was just thinking about his ass in Deadfall. <laughs> Pasty Humble thing. Hummel and the Marines tell them to drop their weapons. 
and tried to talk the SEALs to switch sides. Anderson says he agrees with Hummel, but can't allow him to kill innocent people. And for the first time, we see that Hummel is conflicted with what he's decided to do. Anderson tries to reason with the Marines to lay down their weapons, but things quickly get heated after some rocks fall off a ledge and both sides open fire. And the SEALs are quickly massacred while Mason and Goodspeed helplessly listen from below. With the mission lost, Mason takes off with a machine gun and Goodspeed follows after him. This scene's so cheesy. I hate it. It's <laughs> cringy. So, like they really overrode it to the point where like we gotta have this friendly fire incident, but like nobody's really the bad guy yeah, or to blame. Bit, yeah. And we gotta like make it really melodramatic and it just yeah. it's yeah. I think this was, <laughs> you know, designed to make it uh you know, to set up the seeds of Hummel deciding not to go through with things though yeah, you it know, just makes him seem like a really bad leader though because like mm. he can't even control his men in here and he's like telling yeah. them to cease fire yeah, but they're not listening fire, to him yeah. Yeah. and he just lets this whole thing go sideways they're all like real <laughs> hotheads i mean for the most yeah. part they're all kind of hotheads and you would think that he would not have chosen those kinds of soldiers yeah. but at the same time maybe those are the only soldiers that would just and I'll, and I'll, go <laughs> along with this kind of plan yeah and also it seems like he knew this was a possibility because they set up the sensors to track it, but he still wasn't prepared for the possibility of having to shoot a bunch of soldiers who go in to stop them. It just makes him seem really incompetent. Yeah. <laughs> I think he thought maybe they would lay down their arms and then he would just yeah. take them. I mean, yeah. I guess later he says, I hoped you know, I called their bluff. I, I bluffed and they called it. So maybe he wasn't expecting this to happen. Yeah. Maybe the way it did. But I don't know. It seems like a weird lapse of judgment for a guy they set up as like the most decorated war hero. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Most brilliant leader. tactician in Vietnam. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, back upstairs, Hummel is horrified by what has happened, but he grabs a camera off one of the SEALs' bodies and tells Womack they made a terrible mistake, which caused more of their brothers to die in vain. When they brothers. realize Mace. <laughs> When they realize Mason and Goodspeed are the only ones who live, Womack tells Paxton that Mason that John Mason was a British operative who stole some microfilm from J. Edgar Hoover containing a bunch of top secret information. Mason refuses to disclose the location of the microfilm, so they kept him in jail his entire life since he knew too much, but now he's the only hope they've got. Like, it's just really stupid to, to throw in <laughs> the alien landing yeah. at Roswell. Yeah, well, landing. casually <laughs> confirm that aliens actually <laughs> landed in this universe. Yeah. <laughs> this Michael Bay reality, aliens exist. Well, 100%. <laughs> the aliens he's talking about clearly, clearly are the Transformers. And they uh, sent yeah, an from. asteroid at the Earth, man. <laughs> We cut back to good speed trying to talk Mason into helping him, but when Mason refuses, Stanley pulls his gun and says, All right, you want to play tough? You want to play tough with me? Okay, FBI, free sucker! And tells Mason to throw down. Then he throw says, down. <laughs> Then he says, <laughs> I am an FBI agent. But Mason po- <laughs> points out that his safety is on and takes his gun. <laughs> the way that he's been throughout this whole movie reminded me of Keanu and Point Break. <laughs> <laughs> I am an FBI, FBI agent. agent. <laughs> Goodspeed comes clean that he's not a field agent. Couldn't be more obvious here. And begs Mason to help him disarm the missiles since his girl and unborn child, as well as Mason's daughter, are still in jeopardy. And he's basically helpless against the Marines. I don't think basically like he is helpless against these yeah. Marines. <laughs> Well, it's really convenient for the plot that Mason's daughter lives in San Francisco yeah. where all this is taking place. Yeah. It's yeah. Convenient. <laughs> I mean, I guess if you I guess go it would make with sense the, you know, if he escaped out 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 yeah. Yeah, and then went and banged some <laughs> local chick at a Led Zeppelin concert. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Hummel and his men discover Seal's radio and weapon are missing, so they track down Mason in good speed, who they can overhear talking from like a mile away. <laughs> Tuco chucks some C4 into the tunnel they're in, and before running off, says, A little trick Heisenberg taught me, biatch! <laughs> and then the Marines throw another bomb in the tunnel, which causes a fireball to engulf every inch, every square inch of the sewer system. <laughs> but so uh, <laughs> I had questions about, like, what the hell was that second bomb? Because the first bomb was C4. Yeah. <laughs> Look like a brick of C4, which, as we saw in Die Hard, <laughs> should have exploded <laughs> bigger than what it did. And then the second one was like some old, like, 
fire canisters <laughs> thing it was, or something. It's like a bomb they made out of a uh, uh, gas can. <laughs> so it's just but some then, incendiary. But then it's okay. supposed to like light up the sewer fumes in the sewer. But I thought it was just rain or seawater runoff. I don't know. Yeah, it's more like seawater. <laughs> it's not like sewer. <laughs> sewer. What, <laughs> sewer up, until, up until now, like there wouldn't be any. I don't know. Like the sewer <laughs> like pretty clean down working, there right now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anyways, we're thinking. Oh, it had been again, too long. It had been way too long since there had been an explosion on the screen. I mean, the last one we got was what? The, <laughs> the trolley getting thrown up in the air? Yeah, yeah <laughs> true. Yeah. Well, th- thankfully, Mason and Goodspeed survived by diving under like an inch of water. <laughs> this works every time. If I learned anything from action movies, it's the safest way to survive an explosion above, above you if you're anywhere near water. Yeah. After realizing he doesn't exactly have any other choice, Mason finally agrees to help Goodspeed disarm the bombs. It would have been funny, though, if there was like a turd that floated in between them. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah, so it is sewer. So there must be gases down there. Here at One Cage at a Time, we get things wrong all the time. For instance, remember how we were confidently talking about how those strings in hotel rooms were way too short for Mason to dangle Womack off the balcony of the Fairmont? Well, less than two weeks after recording our episode, I stayed in a hotel room with one of those things and sure enough, it was just as advertised in the movie. I could have easily hung my wife out the window with that thing. I mean, I didn't, but I could have. Stuff like that is exactly why we're choosing to educate ourselves using Libro FM. Libro FM is an incredible resource for dumb guys like us because you can choose from more than 250,000 audiobooks, including bestsellers and recommendations from real booksellers. With Libro.fm, you can also keep money within your community since every subscription or individual sale goes straight to the bookstore of your choice. And if you're watching or listening in the US or Canada, you can get two for the price of one with your first month of membership on Libro.fm by using our coupon code CAGE at checkout. Act 3. The Resolution. Mason leads Stanley through the oldest part of Alcatraz and asks him if he knew it was a Civil War fort. But Goodspeed says, You know, I like history too, and maybe when this is all over, you and I can stop by the souvenir shop together. But right now, I just, I just say I want to find some rockets. (laughs) (laughs) Buy a Declaration of Independence (laughs) at the gift shop. (laughs) I just want to find the Declaration of Independence. (laughs) <laughs> so I guess he's a little on edge. Uh, but then Mason threatens to <laughs> shoot him wired, in the face. A little tired. <laughs> <laughs> Deserves a little respect. <laughs> it's just how he is in these movies. <laughs> these uh, Bruckheimer films. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's like they, they kind of play him as the straight man, but he gets kind of wound up. Yeah. And <laughs> makes his breaking point. You just go off the edge. <laughs> But then Mason threatens to shoot him in the face, so I guess that'll help <laughs> calm his nerves. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Mason's his only hope of survival, so he's kind of... <laughs> yeah. Mason gives him back his gun and asks if he's sure he's ready for this, and Stanley says he'll do his best. <laughs> then Mason says what anyone would say in this kind of situation. Your best. Losers always whine about their best. Winners go home and fuck the prom queen. <laughs> who wrote that was that tarantino you think i, know, <laughs> but I love that line it's so it's <laughs> legendary <laughs> line my dad used to say something similar to me <laughs> then he fucked my mom right in front of me <laughs> <laughs> just to prove a point while keeping my eye contact the whole time <laughs> oh, fuck. then stanley says carla was the prom queen so I guess he's ready uh, yeah. to get this over with so he can go say hiya to her a-hole. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what we're supposed to take away from that line. Like, I, not because he's a winner. Let's Score one for it. nerdy guys, I guess. I guess, yeah. Yes, I, I don't know, dude. It's, it's, <laughs> it is iconic, weirdly. Um oh. But at the same time, it's the like, Sean Connery part's the iconic, hell? but the follow up is <laughs> yeah, yeah, weird. Yeah. like we're supposed yeah, to. I mean, the iconic that scene is. Yeah. Yeah. Iconic. <laughs> I don't know. 
whatever the prom queen sure <laughs> i always thought that line was from finding forrester because <laughs> i had I forgot it was from the rock it just seems fit better in the you're the man now dog <laughs> <laughs> do do british schools have proms I wondered that too. I don't uh, think probably so. Not. They or have what, what do they have in Hogwarts? Probably not in the sixties when, <laughs> or I guess the forties when he would have been in high school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Goodspeed and Mason make their way to the Alcatraz morgue, which I guess doesn't have motion sensors in it. <laughs> yeah, they only put them in like one spot. Yeah, they just, I mean, put them around the actual. There are actual guards in this missiles. one, so I guess. You know, they wouldn't put them there because the guards would be constantly triggering them. Yeah. I guess. I don't know. But uh, by that token, you think the guards would have reported in when some disturbance happened instead of just getting yes. into a firefight and all dying? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was no time. <laughs> <clears throat> Mason spots Goldberg or Steve Austin chilling by a <laughs> rocket and tosses a knife into his throat before us <laughs> saying... <laughs> You must never hesitate. It's just <laughs> such a weird, like, everything just kind of drops and he just says that line. Yeah. Uh, uh, kind of out of nowhere. It's weird. He's, he's, taking, he's taking good speed under his wing now and teaching him to yeah. murder. Be, be a murderous uh, <laughs> operative, I guess. Yeah. I think, I, I'm pretty sure I say it in here, but I think it was to like set up that Mason needs or uh, that good speed needs to stab himself in the heart, like immediately, like he can't Um, hesitate. He has to just do it right away. You must never hesitate. But uh, except Mason or good speed already knows that because he knows the atropine and yeah, but he was very opposed to like taking the shot in the (laughs) opening scene. And then even when they try to hand him the syringe, he's like, no, I don't want that. You know, I'm not going to need it. Another Marine opens fire, but is quickly flushed out by some random liquid in an old apothecary bottle on the shelf that catches fire. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky they just kept that flammable liquid up there all these years. <laughs> Since the 60s. Formaldehyde. Incredibly flammable. <laughs> I guess, is, yeah, it is the morgue, huh? Why is that there? Why? Uh, Michael Bay. <laughs> Michael Bay. Fire. We need fire. to be fired. <laughs> We've had like, uh, John John Woo's we got had sparks. Five minutes. Michael Bay's got explosions. <laughs> <laughs> Their signatures. Touche. Touche. Uh, Stanley tells Mason to stop shooting towards the rocket. <laughs> so John shoots the bad guy in the feet and then drops an air conditioner on his head. Where is everyone else while this is going on? <laughs> They don't they, hear it. They you made a, a bit of a racket. You'd think that other <laughs> Marines would have heard that. <laughs> maybe they just thought they were hearing Oakland off yeah. in the distance <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> Oakland's really popping off tonight <laughs> uh, must have won a game or something <laughs> I mean Alcatraz or isn't lost. that big I'm pretty sure people from the shore would have heard that firefight <laughs> yeah. so <laughs> yeah it's only a mile away yeah you, you hear it I've been to Alcatraz and you, know, you could pretty much hear everything that would be gunshot <laughs> level loud yeah. from anywhere on that island well there's footage of there was an escape breakout in the 50s or something and they had to shoot all of the convicts and stuff and there's footage of like the news out on boats and you can hear the gunshots and see all the smoke and shit going off oh, inside wow. the thing like so you definitely could hear firefights from outside you could definitely hear it inside mm-hmm Anyway, Stanley disarms the first of 15 rockets while the dead guy with the air conditioner on his head twitches nearby, which is slightly distracting to him. (laughs) He tells Mason, Listen, I'm just a biochemist. Most of the time I work in a glass jar and lead a very uneventful life. I drive a Volvo, a beige one. But what I'm dealing with here is one of the most deadly substances the Earth has ever known. So what do you say you cut me some friggin' slack? (laughs) <laughs> mason asks what the uh, rocket full of green gumballs can do and stanley says it can take out an entire city of people mason asks what if you drop one and goodspeed says it stops the brain from sending nerve messages down the spinal car- cord within 30 seconds any epidermal exposure or inhalation and you'll know a twinge in the small of your back as the poison seizes your nervous system your muscles freeze you can't breathe you spasm so hard you break your own back and spit your guts out but that's after your skin melts off (laughs) 
That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> kind of lucky that none of that happens to him when he gets yeah, unless it's in somebody's mouth i guess yeah <laughs> it's closed you know then the guy spit it all over the place and he's like <laughs> fucking six feet from right that on dude. top of him <laughs> <laughs> he removes the guidance system chip from the rocket so it won't take or it won't make it more than 500 feet so I guess he's just cool with killing every animal in the bay. Right. <laughs> like Piece of them shit. falling in the water doesn't cause any kind of ecological disaster. <laughs> yeah. There is that one rocket that splashes in the bay and I'm like, oh, uh-huh. <laughs> that's, that's going to cause some problems. <laughs> <clears throat> Hummel is alerted that the team in the morgue hasn't checked in. <laughs> didn't hear the machine guns, but they didn't check in for a few minutes. <laughs> So he sends everyone to converge on the morgue. Goodspeed manages to disable all but three rockets before they're forced to leave through a laundry chute or body chute. It happens <laughs> to lead to some old mining car- carts. Ground. <laughs> Handy thing to have in a morgue, I guess. Yeah. That how they're disposing of the bodies during that time was like they fall into mining carts and then they just throw them in that water that's down there. <laughs> Yeah, why not? I Usually they incinerate them, but yeah. Maybe <laughs> hey, maybe that's what that furnace is for. Yeah, just mashing and incinerating the bodies. <laughs> <laughs> it just crumples, crumples them up. It's like a hibachi. <laughs> <laughs> the Marines jump in their own mining carts. Then Wily Coyote joins the chase. Then Muttley and Dastardly Dog. It's just wacky, madcap fun. <laughs> Thankfully, the cart Mason and Goodspeed are in has a rope tied to it, so it stops inches from flying off the track into a pit of lava or whatever cartoon reality the <laughs> writers think lives below Alcatraz. <laughs> uh, Goodspeed is thrown to a hanging smelting basket or something. <laughs> uh, while Mason is stuck to the rope that was holding the mining cart, which I'm not sure how that would work, seeing as they were inside the cart, but the rope was like attached to the to the cart back. But now it's cart. wrapped around him. Now it's wrapped around his foot. Anyway, Mason calls uh, Stanley a fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm fine, you fucking idiot. Like, <laughs> how is this Stanley's fault? You know, it's no respect. <laughs> When the Marines get close, Mason sets fire to Dr. Perry Cox's feet using the one item he was given on the helicopter <laughs> earlier that served zero purpose for the mission they were actually trying to accomplish. Don't understand. <laughs> Here's some washers, some lighter fluid, <laughs> a pack of Tic Tacs. <laughs> <laughs> the bad guy falls into the water but dies somehow, even though it was like a six foot drop into water. <laughs> And the other Marines chuck a, a grenade into the basket Goodspeed is hiding in, but it conveniently doesn't explode instantly, like when any two objects slightly <laughs> bump into each other in this movie. <laughs> so he has time to pick it up and throw it back at them, which causes them to both be thrown backwards. Grenades just don't actually do anything in movies. No. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, that's probably the most either that thing. or they or they create giant explosions, which yeah. grenades don't do in real life. No. But like it's shrapnel everywhere. Yeah. They don't, they don't blow up on impact. There's like a little timer in there. So that's probably Mm -hmm. the most realistic part of this movie is that he does have time to throw it back because they don't cook it. But every time they throw a grenade. Shouldn't they have cooked it? At any other time. They They do later. He does. Somebody, I can't remember who it was. Somebody throws a grenade and they cook it and you hear him counting. I think it's when they're in down the road, when after the firefight inside have the disagreement. Uh-huh. He's like, one, two, three. And he throws two of them at him. Yeah. <laughs> Good speed triggers a lever, which causes his basket to start moving, and the Marines get in their own basket, so it's basically just a theme park ride <laughs> at this point. <laughs> Before they can catch up to and kill Stanley, Mason comes down from the ceiling to knock Tuco over the edge to his death. Wasn't he just, like, below and behind Everything is happening now because, like, the baskets start moving. He's tied up down below. They're in, like, a Scooby-Doo funhouse where Mm -hmm. they just go through one door and come out the other on the other side. How did he even get across the water that, like, there was that big hole? (laughs) He's James Bond. I guess. Yeah. That's the answer. It's old hat for him. Yeah. Mason struggles with the other Marine in the basket and Stanley shoots him after he gets the jump on John while screaming... (laughs) 
Yeah. I mean, you know, this is the first time he's ever killed somebody. I'm, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Very dramatic for him. Really reminded me of uh, what at the end of Face Off when he stabs him with the harpoon <laughs> gun. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Die! Die! <laughs> Mason tells him he's rather glad he didn't hesitate too long because because <laughs> he, he said that thing earlier <laughs> about not hesitating never hesitate well, like you i know, said i guess that, that was idiot. <laughs> <laughs> i think that was to to foreshadow him not hesitating to stab himself in the heart that's 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 my theory of what the hesitate thing was but it could also just be this glad you didn't hesitate shooting that guy face hummel and his men bring a hostage out to a courtyard and hop on the loudspeaker to tell mason and goodspeed that if they don't bring back the guidance chips they'll kill this guy goodspeed pulls out the uh chips and mason immediately smashes them so he won't have a chance to to get those away or give them back that's tactical you know <laughs> take it away from the guy who would probably give the chips back mm-hmm. he tells well, stan because he's remembering like when when uh Stanley was in, was interrogating him. He was just like giving him everything he asked for. Mm. So he knew yeah. that Stanley's a terrible negotiator. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> off of me, coffee. Yeah. Take my Idiot. cuffs off. <laughs> Take my cuffs off. <laughs> Get naked, play guitar. <laughs> <laughs> he tells Stanley there are three to go, so he'd better go and find them while he tries to delay Hummel to give good speed more time. John waltzes right into the prison past all the hostages to the courtyard. Well, he didn't open up the cells and let the <laughs> hostages go. I, I mean, where would they have gone, though? I guess, yeah. yeah. Created At that point, chaos. they're more of a headache than, yeah. yeah. But that could have been a good tactical decision because then the the Marines would all be trying to round the hostages back no, up. They would have just to murdered them. them. Yeah, it might have gotten a lot <laughs> yeah, of hostages yeah, killed. Yeah. Um, but, <clears throat> yeah, that's one of my couple of questions. Why he wouldn't let them go. Maybe he could recruit a couple of them to help. Uh, you know, I don't know. Give that lady a gun. I was going to say, give <laughs> that lady a gun. <laughs> she's, she's handy with one. She's going to die hard, this bitch. <laughs> Come uh, that would be great if they said, both died and then it just said. was her story the rest of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, tells Hummel that he's the only one left. He's the, I'm the only threat left or something like that. I, he says it in a really weird way. While well, Goodspeed manages to disarm another rocket, moments for a couple of Marines repel from the air like spider man <laughs> <laughs> Weird. Yeah. <clears throat> you know. They're the best of the best. Of Rather can. than just, like, shoot him, they kick him through a door, <laughs> and he runs <laughs> off with the chip. Meanwhile, Mason tells Hummel what he's doing is an act of lunacy and says, Personally, I think you're a fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Uh. some great lines from connery in this <laughs> hummel knocks him to the ground and asks for the guidance chips and before he can shoot mason they hear gunfire from the distance so i guess they decided to shoot at him after they kicked him through the door but they don't <laughs> want him dead yeah they say that hummel wants him alive for some reason yes so yeah <laughs> why are they shooting at him then <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we see Goodspeed destroy the chip he just removed from the rocket, and he's attacked by a zombie through the wall. <laughs> or Roy Batty from Blade Runner. I don't know. The guy just like <laughs> reaches through the wall and grabs him. And he says he's lucky that uh, they don't kill him because Hummel wants him alive there. Just like, why? Why? Bargaining, I guess. I guess. Or maybe, maybe Hummel, Hummel just really didn't want to kill anybody. Yeah. <laughs> Hummel didn't want any more dead. He wants to make sure that the his guys know that you know yeah you find any more people don't kill them we see a caption that says 52 minutes to deadline and see mason and good speed each in a cell mason so at this tells point, it's 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 is it morning is it daylight by morning, that point yeah. or is it still yeah, dark it's, out it's okay, that's right dawn yeah. yeah okay that's right <clears throat> i got a point about that later on <laughs> mason tells good speed and when there was no meat we ate foul and when there was no foul we ate crawdad and when there was no crawdad to be found, we ate sand. <laughs> <laughs> then Goodspeed hands him some pink snowballs. and <laughs> <laughs> It felt like it had to be a Raising Arizona homage because the camera's looking down on him laying in the cell just like yeah. in Raising Arizona. I feel like there's a lot of those if you go through all of these movies. It's kind of 
other directors <laughs> referencing Cage's past yeah. performances. Hard to see Michael Bay being a fan of the Coen brothers, but yeah, who knows? Raising Arizona. <laughs> I would say that one's pretty approachable. Cartoony. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah it's got Michael, explosions Michael and Bay shit. Michael Bay can it, wrap so his head around like cartoons, it. you know? Yeah. <laughs> Gang explodes. <laughs> Yeah, he probably loves the the climax with the, yeah, the biker, the biker explodes. <laughs> Spoilers for Raising Arizona. No, really good speed just repeats what the guy said when he captured him. I'll take pleasure in gutting you, boy, over and over and rants about how the Marines are filled with pubescent volatility. And let me tell you, you do not want people with pubescent volatility around you in prison. <laughs> Uh, while this is going on, Mason makes a rope out of a mattress and tells Goodspeed his whole life story so that, you know, he knows his mo- character motivations later on. We cut to the White House where they say they haven't heard from their men in, on Alcatraz for seven hours. So they decide to OK the thermite plasma bomb thingy to wipe out an iconic structure that's part of the National Park Organization. Monsters. Oh, and kill uh, 81 civilians and French Marines and stuff. <laughs> Who cares about that part? <laughs> national parks. Well, he's, he's doing the math. You know. Preserve our national parks. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Protect our Mason, parks. Why the hell is Alcatraz a national park? <laughs> it's not a national park. It's just part of the national park system. It's okay. not, it's not a its own thing, but it is historical landmark. run by the national park system. All right. it's, it's in the... Uh, it's one of those offshoots, which for the longest time, like um, the St. Louis Arch was, but now it's a national park. And I'm like, why, how, in what world is the St. Louis Arch a national park? I don't understand that at all. It's probably from funding or something. It yeah, ties into the bureauc- bureaucratics of running them. Maybe it's to preserve because it's on the shores of the Mississippi. So maybe it's preserving the Mississippi in some way. I don't know. Makes no sense. Mason uses the rope to pull a lever opening his jail cell while Stanley asks, How in the name of Zeus's butthole did you get out of your cell? You know, because he knew how to get through the tunnel system and all that stuff, but never answered how he got his cell open. And on cue, John opens Stanley's cell. In the Marines Control Center, some doofus who somehow becomes the main character of the last 20 minutes of the film (laughs) yells about the location of the other two rockets as if Hummel doesn't know. General, two operational rockets left. One's at the lower lighthouse and there is one on the roof and both of the birds are ready to fly, sir. General, can you hear me? I heard you, Captain. Oh, just making sure. And then Candyman asks him if they should prepare to launch. That guy just turns into like the, he's just like, he's just the bad guy now. Yeah. yeah. He's just the dude. <clears throat> I, I remember seeing him in the repel scene and that's about it. But then this last act, it's all, it's all him. He's the powerhouse. Yeah. Outside Mason heads for the exit since he vowed not to die on this toilet. <laughs> and Stanley tells him, you're not leaving. There's a madman in there with his hand on a, on a button. Mason tells him he could see hum- see in Hummel's eyes that he won't actually launch the missiles, um, which Stanley's very upset that he's going to take it on a whim, <laughs> that he's not actually going to blow anything up, kill millions of people. Back in the control room, Hummel gets a call three minutes before the deadline, and they ask for another hour. Candyman says they're calling their <laughs> calling your bluff and playing you for a fool. And then that that doofus who was yelling earlier says, come on, let's be all we can be. Isn't that the army slogan? Quick yeah. fact, that is the army slogan and <laughs> These not are supposed to the be Marines. Marines. <laughs> they would hate. <laughs> yeah, that. they should have just shot that guy right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the men all goad Hummel into launching a missile and he finally agrees. Outside, Goodspeed decides he doesn't need Mason and heads off to kick the platoon full of Marines' asses by himself as Mason runs for it. Stanley is caught immediately, like literally seconds later. (laughs) (laughs) And he asks his captor whether he wants to end up in a glass jar or a plastic bag because the wind will carry the gas back to the island if they launch. What weird containers to choose? (laughs) Glass (laughs) jar plastic bag yeah the marine tells stanley sure let's go 
And then, and just then, Mason shows up and breaks the guy's neck. No, wait, he tells Goodspeed to shut the fuck up. And then Mason, Mason breaks his neck. <laughs> that would have been great, though. Just, <laughs> okay, I agree. Let's do it. <laughs> we cut to the Marines getting coordinates from Hummel for where to launch the uh, first missile. It turns out they aimed it right at a Raiders game. So no big loss, really. I mean, best, best possible outcome. Yeah, I, I feel like he really should just let that thing land. <laughs> I, You're really helping out America. So here, here was my point, though. Like, would a Raiders game be taking place at dawn or early in the morning? Uh, no. Is that, no. Because I feel Not like football all. games take place in the afternoon. 10 yes. o'clock would be this the was, earliest that it would be played. <laughs> and this is like shortly after dawn. It's it's clearly early in the morning. Uh-huh. And, and it's a packed stadium yeah. for a football <laughs> game that's like in progress. That's a really I mean, good point. <laughs> they could have been tailgating because everybody knows Raiders fans like to show up early. But they were in the stadium. Yeah, they, they show the shot in, of the stadium that's no, full of people. <laughs> <laughs> they only let you in like an hour or so before, before game time. Yeah. And that was, they said 52 minutes to the deadline. So we're at the deadline now, which would have mm-hmm. been, you know, it was still dark out when that thing showed up. So it can't be more than an hour past dawn. Well, it was seven hours past the time that they got caught. Um, and they said 52 minutes to the deadline, but it looked like it was dawn. So maybe it's like okay, seven, it's 8 a.m. Still couldn't. Yeah, it still couldn't be more There's than no an way. hour past dawn, no, which yeah. is definitely, I don't know, a football game. I don't, I've never been to one, but I don't think they start at eight in the morning. <laughs> no. I've been to. It was in October. So because they said it was October 5th is, is uh, earlier in the movie when uh, when Stanley's doing his. Oh, yeah. Disarming the bomb. He says it's October yeah, 5th. It's October. Yep. And yeah. Whatever. So. You know, it would have had to have been probably seven or so to be dawn in October, seven or eight in the morning yeah. on the West Coast. So, <laughs> yeah. The, the latest that football game could be going on was probably like 9 a.m., which I doubt. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, it, to have the fans in the stadium, 9 a.m. would be pretty much the earliest possible. And it wouldn't be. Um, and that. usually the 10 a.m. start time is actually East Coast. So 10 a.m. on the yeah. West Coast. So it's one when they're actually playing. So yeah, they but usually there, don't there start are some games West Coast here. Games that do take place at 10. It, it mm-hmm. varies, but yeah. most West Coast games are yeah afternoon games. Yeah, <clears throat> I went to two Raiders games in that stadium before they moved to Las Vegas, and I saw somebody smoking crack both times. <laughs> Dude, don't in the, the players out like that in the stadium. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, no, wait, Hummel types something into the keyboard and the missile heads out to sea where it presumably just wiped out the next crab quota. A <laughs> uh, quick fact, <laughs> it's funny, the coordinates given for Alcatraz when the missile is launched are 67 degrees by blah, 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 70 th- or 37 degrees. <coughs> These actually put you in Greenland. <laughs> huh. Alcatraz is actually 37 degrees by 122 degrees. With a bunch of other coordinates. I'm not going to read that shit off, but <laughs> like somebody's going to call me on it. No, no. It's a little more specific than that. <laughs> I just thought that was funny. <laughs> You're missing. I always push. wonder like why, like when somebody writes that out, they don't ch- just, you know, look it I up. I guess back then a little harder <laughs> to look it up in 1996, but nowadays you could just like, you know, you could look that up in about four seconds. On AOL Google. existed. And you could have. <laughs> yeah. Also, you could have looked it up. You know, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. But you're not going to stop your cocaine field writing session to go look up fucking longitude latitude coordinates that coordinates. no one's going to care about. Yeah. Unless Except some dweeb on the internet podcasts. writes it on IMDb. <laughs> <laughs> but <it> was, <laughs> who could have predicted IMDb back in the day? <laughs> oh, pedantic ass nerds definitely existed in the in the nineties. <laughs> Candyman freaks out and it becomes clear that Hummel never actually intended to kill civilians. Mason and Goodspeed make their way through Alcatraz to try to find the uh, final rocket. No motion sensors anywhere where they're going. By, but, you know. <laughs> and then they like end up overhearing Hummel and his right-hand man arguing about what happened with the missile and just kind of post up there for the next like three scenes for some reason. Just like hanging outside rather than going to find the rocket or anything. They just... Hang out. The jets with the uh, thermite plasma take off and head for Alcatraz, and we see Hummel arguing with uh, more of his men. They all kind of like gang up on him, <clears throat> like in the showers. 
<laughs> he orders them to load up the VX gas onto a helicopter and grab some hostages, but they refuse because they want their fucking money. Yeah. So now it's not about the patriotism or caring about their their mm. fellow soldiers. <laughs> they just want their million dollars, which is actually yeah. more than a million now since most of them are dead. So <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's true. They're gonna bigger payout. Those he wanted like a hundred million dollars. To go to, to the, pay the 83 80 families. Yeah. families, and then they were going to keep the other 17. So I guess there were 17 of them, and now there's 10. Five. Five. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> Almost says he was never going to kill uh, civilians because he's not out of his mind. So the other guys mutiny, and they all blast <laughs> each other in a uh, Mexican standoff uh, that would put face off to shame. <laughs> Only thing missing were random shots of guns firing, doves, and a complete lack of coherence. <laughs> <laughs> that one just like cuts yeah. away from the action and it just, we just <clears throat> see them all on the ground. <laughs> this one actually. Yeah. I mean, give Michael Bay credit. He, yeah. he can do action scenes. <laughs> he can. Yeah. <laughs> Unless they're robots. Then he just like yeah. <laughs> smashes or a car them chase. together. Yeah. Or a car chase. <laughs> While all that was going on, Mason and Goodspeed just kind of sat outside the room. Um, uh, they eventually join in on, uh, with the gunfight and pull the general to safety. Goodspeed asks where the last rocket is, and he tells him it's in the lighthouse. And then Goodspeed heads out to disarm it while Hummel dies, and Mason hops in a bathtub to avoid some grenades being thrown at him. By that uh, be all you can be guy. Goodspeed finds the final rocket and pulls out the VX gas, but is interrupted by Candyman, who decides to take Stanley out with a knife for some reason. When Goodspeed <laughs> yeah. asks if he can- has a gun, <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, he just didn't want to shoot the the, the, the gas. I yeah. guess the yeah. pearls. <laughs> it seems like getting in a one-on-one tussle with him would also have dropped the, yeah. the pearls and killed both of them. So yeah, I don't know what his his end game there was. Maybe he didn't, have a hook. I think he, he didn't have I think a hook he was, available. <laughs> <I did. laughs> Stanley should have called him in the in the mirror. <laughs> um, Candyman uh, asks if uh, Goodspeed asks if Candyman knows how this shit works, referring to the gas, and Candyman asks if he knows how this shit works, referring to his knife. <laughs> Goodspeed works his way around to a control panel where he launches the missile minus the VX gas right into Candyman's chest after asking him if he likes the song Rocket Man. (laughs) Well, more accurately, he says, well, I only bring it up because uh, it's you. You're the Rocket Man. Do you know how that shit works? (laughs) Uh. So he took out the VX gas from the rocket, but then reassembled the rocket so that it could launch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why? <laughs> Why not? I don't know. So he could do this. So he could do this. Okay. And also so the, the movie rocket could happen. Does it? I, mean, I don't know how fast rockets take off, but I'm sure it's pretty fast. <laughs> Faster than shown in the movie. Fast enough to p- slowly push a guy out a window, but not kill him <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that he falls to his death. Yeah, and that's what actually kills him. Fence. <laughs> I feel like it would have been pale, dude. <laughs> it would have just gone yeah, through Yeah, it would have just I gone think. right through him, I think. <laughs> it would have been ripped in half by the rocket. Yeah. <laughs> um, instead, Candyman is impaled on a fence post. <laughs> and the rocket <laughs> splashes in the bay. Stanley yeah. heads to the top of the lighthouse to remove the guidance chip, but he accidentally drops one of the VX gas marble thingies in the process. But he manages to grab it just in time before it falls off the edge, and rather than put it in a drain like he did the other gas balls, he just puts it in his pocket. You know, most <laughs> deadly substance he could possibly carry around <laughs> while in an action, you know, scary sequence here. Just keeps it in his pocket. So the movie could happen. Uh-huh. Uh, while another guy shoots at him from a nearby building with a machine gun. <laughs> t- token Blackman's brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got you, baby. <laughs> I got you, baby doll. <laughs> or first he yells at him, like tips him off that he's about to shoot at him, which is what allows him to roll to safety and then not yeah. get shot. <laughs> Highly trained Marine. 
Right. <laughs> Mason uh, runs at that guy and tosses him off the roof. While another, well, the I, I think it's the that guy, the BL you can be guy. Yeah. Works his way upstairs to good speed. Yeah. Stanley jumps off the lighthouse, <laughs> but is totally fine despite it looking like a good <laughs> twenty foot drop or so. If he's like the top of the lighthouse <laughs> yeah. and where he ended up landing. It's Jumped off it like it's an oil rig. Parkour. <laughs> in the ocean. <laughs> yeah. And he swam to San Francisco. <laughs> uh, we cut to Mason hanging a guy with an old chain, then back to good speed, jumping <laughs> through a window while being shot at. The guy looks like Will Sasso. <laughs> the guy, that he, the guy <laughs> that he hangs from the chain. <laughs> he does. <laughs> Another um, Steve Austin lookalike. <laughs> <laughs> he gets the jump on the Marine and they go round and round for a minute until Goodspeed stuffs the ball of VX gas in the guy's mouth, which he spits all over the place. <laughs> Goodspeed doesn't hesitate and stabs the syringe full of atropine right into his heart so he doesn't die. Though I'd imagine part of the deal is that you have to get more than like 10 feet from the guy. Yeah. Yeah. Who, who is still spewing gas all over the place. The, the flesh eating gas. <laughs> it goes everywhere. Stab it in your heart. You're fine. And thank God that syringe wasn't damaged during all that falling through windows off buildings and <laughs> mine carts. Uh, this is the quick fact I teased earlier. Um, VX nerve agent is an oily liquid that is actually amber in color, not green, as in the movie. I don't know why they decided to change the color. Fuck with the filters Just that make Michael it B look puts interesting. On. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Everything was <laughs> everything was already, already orange. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the after after absorption through the skin and or mucous membranes, it takes approximately one to two hours before visible nerve agent symptoms begin to show. However, if a person is exposed to the aerosol form of the VX gas, effects are immediate. In either case, the symptoms of VX poisoning resemble more of a full-body seizure than a bubbly melting of the skin. That's not At, cool. <laughs> yeah, it's not as cool. You, you gotta look like a Cardassian before you Right. <laughs> Atropine must only be injected into the heart when poisoning by the aerosol version occurs. Otherwise, the atropine is injected into the thigh. <clears throat> Furthermore, atropine is also poisonous to the human body when it's injected uh, before aerosol exposure occurs. Either case, atropine's main side effect weakens the body to the point of incapacitation, and uh, he would be in no fit state to defuse the bomb or get up and run and wave flares as depicted in the movie. Well, they make him look kind of tired, at least. Yeah, he looks sleepy. <laughs> He's a big fucking cage, dude. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Anyway, Stanley writhes in pain on the ground for a second and almost passes out. But then suddenly, Michael Bean's ghost tells him to light the flares <laughs> so they know the threat has been neutralized. When he neutralizes the threat, the launch green flares will be waiting for the cavalry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad they threw that in there because I totally forgot that throwaway line at the very beginning. <laughs> yeah. Or before you know, the operation. Yeah. That's yeah. probably so. when they were editing it. They were like, yeah, the editor was like, yeah, we got to put this in it. shit. <laughs> it's been like seven hours since we started this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Again, the editor saving the movie. Yep. Yep. Shawshank Redemption, man. He obliges and heads outside. But wouldn't you know it, the jets are already there. And before they, uh, the FBI sees the flares from a distance and tells them to abort the mission. They launch one missile. Quick fact, most of the scenes involving FAs, FA-18s are actually stock footage of the Blue Angels. <laughs> I, that formation definitely looked like a Blue yeah. Angel. Yeah. Uh, Super tight. Thing. Yeah. Like the the under the bridge shot. Mm -hmm. They do that every time they come here for uh, uh, mm -hmm. Fleet Week. They Thought do that, that every CGI. year. Um. Might have actually been a real shot because um, <laughs> yeah. the, the Blue Angels do do that maneuver. They go under the bridge and they go really tight over the top of Coit Tower and stuff. That's pretty sweet. Yeah, it is. It's actually, if you're ever in San Francisco during Fleet Week, go check out the air show. It's actually pretty badass. <laughs> Goodspeed is thrown into the ocean by the explosion, but Mason <laughs> jumps in and saves him. How he, like, wait, yeah, I mean, he was over on the <laughs> other building... <laughs> Also, why is it when yeah. explosions happen, it never actually hurts anybody? It just, no, throws, it just throws them. them. Yeah. 
Also, yeah, the explosion was close enough to throw him through the air without liquefying his entire <laughs> body. And he falls off of, I don't know, 100 feet up where the wherever the hell he was into the water, which is all a bunch of rocks all around mm-hmm. the, the <laughs> island. So he would have definitely been crushed by the surf, not just like gently fall into a pool of water like he does. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that that yeah, water out there isn't known for being, you know, <laughs> dangerous or <laughs> right currents of any kind. You know. <laughs> the FBI radio radio the island, and Stanley lets them know that the hostages are all alive. Though he probably couldn't have known that since you know he wasn't anywhere near it. But you know, whatever. I guess they know that the backside of the island was hit, not the prison part of the island. Uh, <clears throat> Womack asks about Mason, and Stanley tells him he was vaporized in the explosion. She's very confused about later. He is the director of the FBI, but (laughs) no idea about that stuff. That can happen. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) He tells Mason that Womack tore up his pardon to take the scuba gear that they came to the island with and head to his hotel room where he'll find clothes and $200 in a Bible. I I mean, I guess that was a 90s thing, like... Just keeping backup money. Just bring cash, like, yeah. But like I mean, the FBI doesn't have anybody hanging out at Stanley's hotel room. Like it's just, mm. I guess maybe they wouldn't. Well, no, they're all in the. They? They're all in the warehouse. They're all in the warehouse. Yeah. I have two questions of that. Okay, I I guess the two hundred dollars I'm guessing was for Carla when she shows up. But Buy yourself something nice, doll. Why does he have a hotel room? Because he like flew directly there, and they just went straight to getting Mason and all that stuff. Did they actually have time to stop off? Maybe he got him? a hotel room for Carla. <clears throat> so I was didn't thinking, want to when up. did he have a, to- a chance to like drop money off and close? And stuff? <laughs> I'm sure he did. I'm sure he had a hotel room because he was. I know, but like it was an emergency. He was grabbed in DC, flown. Yeah, but they would have to still booked him a hotel room to stay at. You yeah, know, he wouldn't because... have had a chance to go to that hotel room. I don't think, uh, unless he was nah. staying. Well, no, he wasn't staying at the Fairmont. He was staying no. at Pacific Park, something or other. Um, <clears throat> If he was staying at the Fairmont, that would make sense. But they specifically called out that it wasn't the Fairmont. <laughs> Probably because the Fairmont had a bunch of FBI agents at it. Yeah, true. <laughs> Mason thanks him and tells him where he can find the microfilm that he stashed years earlier, thus endangering Goodspeed's life for the rest of time. But, you know, whatever. <laughs> he <laughs> yeah, says he, why, why does he tell him? Like, why does, <laughs> I don't know. So this last scene could happen. Uh, he says he stashed it in Kansas. Ah, Kansas, a place no one would ever think to look for anything interesting. <laughs> <laughs> kind of perfect, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, quick pretty- fact, this is interesting. Michael Bay actually had an idea for a sequel that involved a now married Goodspeed in possession of the microfilm, but he finds himself being pursued by the government, exactly like I said. Uh, with no one else to turn to, he's forced to ask Mason for help, which would have been a, kind of a cool movie. We would have had to call yeah. it something completely different. The hard than- place. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we cut to Stanley and Carla in hell. Oh, wait, that's Kansas. Uh, couldn't tell because the sky is red for some reason. <laughs> We're about to have a freaking tornado or something go through there. Why is it so dark? It's just such an aggressive color grade in that scene. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> They drive away from a uh, church that uh, the microfilm was was stashed in, and drive away in a rusted old VW <laughs> Beetle. <laughs> yeah, why not the beige Volvo? <laughs> why are they driving that Beetle? It's like, <laughs> where the hell did they get it? I don't think you can even rent something that no. old and falling apart. And I'm sh- driving away in a PT Cruiser or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it has uh, just married written on the uh, rear windshield, so we know that they just got married. In Kansas. I'm like, did they get married in Kansas? Did they get married in San Francisco? <laughs> Why? Drove, Kansas. Drove, drove the whole way there with the all kids way Kansas. The San <laughs> <laughs> Stanley finds the microfilm in a wooden leg. Oh, I got it. They got married at the church in yeah, Kansas. And then stole so the then, thing. And then yeah. he stole it. <laughs> yeah. It would be a good excuse to be there. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Yeah. And then the like preacher yells like thieves or something at them. Vandals. 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 Because <laughs> they broke the pew chair or the pew leg. 
Anyway, Stanley finds the microfilm in a wooden table leg, and while examining it, he asks Carla if she wants to know who really killed JFK. And they drive off through the apple orchards and towards the mountains that Kansas is famous for. (laughs) Quick fact, the final scene takes place in Kansas, yet they drive through a citrus grove, (laughs) and there are mountains in the distance, (laughs) neither of which exist in Kansas. Hey, maybe they got that filming in L.A. that they really wanted <laughs> just true. for that scene. Yeah. <laughs> Shot it out in Orange <laughs> County. Kind of looked like it was like in uh, the Central Valley somewhere. <clears throat> maybe with yeah. the uh, uh, Sierras off in the distance. <laughs> Anyways, the end. Feels good to finally have the, the Holy Trinity wrapped up. Yeah. Ooh. We finished the man series. <laughs> yeah. And now we finish the, the Holy Trinity. The Trinity. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the the 96, 97 trilogy. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. Like, it's crazy that those three movies came out right after yeah, each like other. Like, within a year. Yeah. <laughs> we have a couple of questions before we move on. A uh, couple of questions here. Uh, we kind of answered this one, but is that her P in that file? <laughs> Is what? Is it her oh, pee in oh, that little pee. vial? <laughs> Not her pee. Is her it her pee? It would, it would have to be, really. <laughs> I'm guessing. <laughs> Why? <laughs> eh, not worth asking, I guess. No. Um, we also kind of answered this one, but, you know, why did they feel the need to repel out of the helicopter when they were just going to land 10 seconds later? <laughs> yeah. Um, what did the hostages eat while they were in there? I mean, sand. I, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted the same thing. Like, what were they feeding them, and when were they taking them to the bathroom? Between all, and the- there's toilets in the cells. Yeah, so, so there's that. And the plumbing still the works. Plumbing apparently works apparently according to works. just like the heating and the the power and everything. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm pretty positive that that plumbing does not work. In the- <laughs> yeah. I, if I was one of those prisoners, I would be like, just slay me. I'm not gonna take a shit in a crowded. <laughs> I'm not cell. Take a shit in front of that <laughs> black guy I'm stereotype ready. over there. <laughs> Just slay me. I mean, there is a gift shop yeah. uh, with like popcorn and. Okay. Yeah. I mean, they only had it for like it. 40 hours. I guess it's true. As long as they got them water, they'd probably be fine. Yeah, true. They let all the kids go, so they don't have to worry about feeding those. Why would they bring Carla to the command center rather rather than just send her home? Yeah. That's why I was saying he should have just like asked the FBI to like detain her or something or send anything. Her back. Just get her out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we had to have that character of emotional weight uh, throughout just to cut to her face reacting to whatever's <laughs> happening. Stupid reaction. There's the hell over on Alcatraz. Why weren't there motion sensors around the rockets? But were in some random shower like way <laughs> off in the distance. <laughs> That one I really think is because the rockets were supposed to be guarded yeah. at all times, but then that kind yeah. of fell apart as the infighting happened and they started picking off people one by one. But then why are there not motion sensors anywhere else besides that one location? That one. <laughs> Maybe there are and we just didn't see them because that's where they came in was through there. But like John and Stanley walk around the prison all over the place yeah, and true. they never trigger <clears throat> anything else. They, there's no motion sensor in the lighthouse. Uh, when they go over there, yeah, there's no motion sensor up on the roof. I don't know. Hummel's a genius, <laughs> He's a tactical genius. He knew exactly the where they would come in. Yeah, I mean, maybe, uh, possibly, that is the reason. <laughs> I mean, it would make a certain amount of sense as a non-military person. Just me thinking, like, just put motion sensors on the like likely mo- areas of ingress, mm-hmm. and then not bother with other places because yeah. you know. Once they show up, you know they're there. You don't need motion sensors everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And then just rely on the rest <clears throat> of the Marines to patrol and catch people. Yeah. Um, I guess that's true. <laughs> we sort of asked this in the, in the moment, but why was the morgue chilled? <laughs> <laughs> plot point. Make any sense. That's just it. Only yeah. For, just for the plot. Like, why do they even have to have the stuff be chilled in the first place? Because it raises that question. Like, yeah, because they're not the chilled script, in cares? the rockets. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, yeah, mostly <laughs> these don't have answers. I feel like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we also asked this, uh, why didn't John release the hostages when he had a chance? Yeah, I think it's 
what you said, like, it's just that's the safest place for him right now. Yeah. Is because he also knows because he had he'd talked to Hummel at that point. Right. So he knew yeah. Hummel wasn't wasn't going to well, kill he him. He walked past the hostages to talk to Hummel. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. He hadn't talked to him yet. That's right. Yeah. OK. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe he just didn't. He just want to deal with a bunch of them. Yeah, they're kind of contained. He's got the situation under control as it is. He doesn't need the yeah. more chaos. Does does yeah? He doesn't need the un, unexpected complication of a bunch of hostages running around. Yeah, I do think it it would be the uh, from a you know tactical standpoint that is the safest place for them. If they start running around, it's just going to cause utter chaos, and they'll probably all get killed by the Marines. Why not just shoot Mason and Goodspeed? <laughs> scene yeah. where they were both you know in a in a situation where they could be killed <laughs> why like lock them up in right. the prison i mean you know hummel doesn't know that mason knew how to get out of one of those prison cells i mean i'm sure he thought there's no way in hell that this guy's going to be able to get yeah. out of here i think he just didn't yeah. want to kill any more doesn't want to kill people. any more people he didn't yeah. want to kill the seals yeah <clears throat> he is yelling like cease fire the cease whole fire, time yeah. that those guys yeah. are being wasted. But you know, damn also, you for like making he knows me do this. Mason's a military man because he talked to him about being a soldier or whatever in the British Army, and and uh, Stanley's a, a FBI agent doesn't want to kill any other <laughs> government yeah. employees or anything like that. So, in a weird way, you know, Mason is sort of. The, the thing that he's the good the Hummel is fighting for is like somebody who was on a secret mission who was just left behind by his yeah. government. Basically screwed by two governments. Mm -hmm. Uh and then my final question is why are they driving that old crappy car? <laughs> <laughs> also, where the hell did that bulldog come from? <laughs> there's this, a dog? Yeah, yeah, there's a dog with yeah, him. There's a dog. They got a bulldog. <laughs> this is some sort of like weird dream sequence. <laughs> was Stanley killed for knowing too much? And this is like his last thoughts. <laughs> Homage to Terminator when they have a dog driving through Mexico at the end of it. That's <laughs> <laughs> just a very weird scene. He's wearing like that same stupid hat he wore in Matchstick Men. <laughs> <laughs> Pick me. It's just kind of pointless. Like I, the whole thing is is dumb. Yeah. That whole ending is stupid. Yeah, Had to it's a stupid ending. leave him with something funny. Didn't really have a good ending, uh, you know, if they leave it at him just walking away from Alcatraz. And we, we've yeah. set up that this microfilm exists through the whole movie. So Right. They use it as sort of a, not really a MacGuffin, but a plot device. Yeah. So I guess you got to leave that part thing. I think it would have just been better to have like, I don't know, him and Carla with their kid walking around somewhere and they Mason sees them at a coffee shop or something and shows the microfilm or something puts it back in his pocket like like the end I'm free, of the, I still got the it. nolan batman trilogy yeah, yeah i was gonna say yeah. like <laughs> it's like the scene from the batman but i mean i think that would have worked well for this movie because it would have shown like yeah mason got out he's still alive he's got the microfilm yeah you know i think we're left stanley's assume, happily happy with his wife and kid yeah because we don't really see an ending <laughs> to mason's story but i we're left to assume yeah. that he reconnected with his daughter and Mm -hmm. Right, um, but now it's like presumably okay, never so gets caught again. Right, but now it's like okay, well, Stanley's got the microfilm for some reason. Like, yeah. why? I guess to set up a sequel that never happened. Maybe I don't know. I think it was just a way of like making a fun, funny ending yeah. to it. Talked about this earlier, like almost calling them all patriots, but also like they're really in it for a million dollars. But then I guess that's to set up what happens at the end um, with them all. <laughs> the ones that are left actually being just in it for the money, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think and at a certain really point, wanting to kill thousands of civilians. <laughs> yeah. At a certain point they've lost everything. And so they want to see right. the fulfillment of this, you know, idea um, that they've been pushing along for all this time. My other one was why does, uh, why does Goodspeed freak out so much about going on the mission, like throwing up in the bathroom and stuff? When earlier we saw him, like, diffuse the bomb under pressure, and he's totally fine with it. Like that's his element and stuff. I guess it's just the the thought of being under fire, maybe going yeah. into a combat situation is completely different from almost being blown up by C four and killed by horrible sarin gas. But I mean, it doesn't seem like it. I sort of me. set this up as almost like a suicide mission going on to that yeah that <clears throat> island and. You know. Yeah, but they've already established like he does well under pressure and he doesn't really 
Like he minds, he obviously doesn't want to die, but like he's okay in life or death situations. Like mm-hmm. he keeps his cool and, and knows what to do. It just seemed like a weird character yeah. inversion. <laughs> oh, I think it's because it's like it two different. It's two different situations. One's controlled, where he he knows that if he can handle the situation, he walks out of that chamber. The other one, he's walking into a bunch of unknown with highly trained uh, Marines who he thinks would shoot him in a heartbeat. So yeah, I guess. It, Plus Mason, it, like he thinks Mason's a murderer. Yeah, <laughs> or, yeah. You know, he doesn't know he's been locked Mason's, up. Yeah, he doesn't know Mason's story. It's a pretty so. intimidating <laughs> thing to. to, <laughs> yeah. to I walk just see into. weird when they already showed how he can handle life or death stuff just yeah. fine and and actually be kind of heroic about it, but then to show him like be totally freaked out about this. Um, better again before is good speed a chemical expert or an explosives expert? Like which which one is he? <laughs> I know he's a chemical expert, but they also sort of show him as being an explosive expert, but they don't really mention that other than he's got uh, all his education is in chemistry. Yeah. <laughs> and he nerds out about that. Uh, he's a genius. I mean, you saw that Rube Goldberg thing that he <laughs> set up. No, he's just incredibly smart. Those are always yeah. this, the sign that you're absolutely <laughs> you brilliant. Set up a Rube Goldberg. <laughs> AV, good speed. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh yeah. So, Mason, if Mason escaped, when he escaped from Alcatraz, he had to come through that furnace that he memorized all of the the machinations of. But there was a locked door that they couldn't come through to come in to Alcatraz. So on his way out, wouldn't he be able to just go through that door? <laughs> why did why did he have to like? <laughs> why was the, the door was locked from the other side? as they were trying to come in. So presumably as he was leaving, that door would have been unlocked from that side. And he could have just walked through it. Why did he have to go back through the furnace to unlock the door to let them in? That's a really good question. <laughs> You're not supposed to think about that. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't have any answer for that one. Maybe <laughs> that he came really through me. all of the, the, the mining cart stuff and then had to go through that door to get some, <laughs> but I don't think he knew, he didn't know he didn't know about the mining cart stuff because I think oh. at some point they ask him he he doesn't know what any of this stuff is or like the the mining situation like he's I don't think he's familiar with those tunnels uh, if I remember right there's something he says but anyway that was just one of the ones that <laughs> confused me like he had to come through this room obviously so why couldn't he just go through the door he just used to, yeah. to unlock and let the let all the seals in he also says that he waited for the tides on that so like was the cistern empty uh when he broke out and like crawled through might have been might have been yeah <clears throat> he spent what he spent two days waiting or something like that or was it just waiting for the i don't remember so here's another question this is like okay theoretically if he had opened his cell the way that he sh- showed in the movie they would have heard it they would have totally heard right him opening and there would have been guards watching it and I he think. also made it seem like he knew this whole tunnel system backwards and front. So he had to escape like every freaking night for months in order to <laughs> like figure out all of that stuff. So he was opening the door with a rope every freaking <laughs> night. All the other cellmates would hear that too. Like everybody would have known. Or he just, he only opened the cell once, got into the tunnels and then spent however long navigating the tunnels and learning it while he was down there like Gollum and then <laughs> and then escaped and he had a photographic memory so he remembered the pathway or he was just bullshitting he didn't actually remember the tunnels he just wanted to use it as an excuse to get on the island so he could escape I took, yeah, I, I took it about. as he wanted to use that as a way to get you know escape from the FBI <clears throat> he never planned on like going back with them he yeah ditch and- which although in that case then why did he let him through the door in the first place after he got through the furnace yeah. cuz he, he still needs them, them to there. go accomplish their shit so he can then sneak Oh away. so he can escape yeah cuz they were blocking his only way out at that yeah. point yeah. Mm. Uh other ones we talked about why is there a football game in the morning <laughs> <laughs> uh, at, uh oh at the end when Stanley's going to disarm the last bomb. He's like running up the stairs with the VX poison in his hand. Like and earlier, he's like telling Mason to be completely like stable yeah. with it. He's like, that's yeah. that's the most dangerous stuff in the world. Be careful with it. And, and by the end, he's just like sprinting up the stairs, holding it. <laughs> he can't hesitate. Uh, yeah, I guess he can't. He can't. He's, he's out of time at that point. Be hilarious. It, I guess if he doesn't run, going he's going to get shot anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <coughs> 
<laughs> uh, and then why, why, why does Mason tell him where the microfilm is again? Like what, what's the point of that? Now he just puts him in danger yeah. of these secrets. Final payoff uh, of the movie. Um, yeah. It's yeah. the only reason I can think of just so people weren't, would be completely unsatisfied with that. What's it? Who's he going to uh, tell about those right. secrets? Yeah. <laughs> Russia or Mason uh, could just tell Russia. him like I, I destroyed them or something like there are no microfilms. I, I got rid of them. They're, they're gone. So yeah. that's why that's why I can't tell them where they're at. They don't believe me that they don't exist anymore or something. I don't know. Yeah. Who do you think killed JFK? Yeah. <laughs> Snowden. <laughs> Snowden. <laughs> Obviously somebody that uh, Stanley recognizes just by looking at it in yeah. the microfilm. So. <laughs> uh, is, uh, is Lyndon that B. Bill? Johnson. <laughs> It's, it's Womack. Oh. Yeah. It's, Womack. It's, it's Mason. <laughs> Selfie of him with the hey. body. <laughs> Is that James Bond? Selfie of him with Lee Harvey Oswald in the book depository. <laughs> You're a good man. <laughs> it's time to keep track. Here are the final stats. Trackers. Uh, Nigel, why don't you hit us with the old curse tracker? This one was kind of light. So this movie had a total of eight curses. Um, one one hell. There's actually two, but one of them he's actually talking about hell in, in the, the noun, so I didn't count it. Uh, two uses of shit. One use of ass, which talking about his stomach doing hula hoops around his ass. Uh-huh. Uh, he says God twice, and he actually says uh, fuck once and motherfucker once, so I counted two fucks. Mm. Um and then obviously honorable mention to a holes and frigging and uh, all the other non swears he says earlier on in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> it, is, it seems like cage does that a lot where he's like, no, I don't feel like this character would curse. That yeah. Much. Yeah. Unless he's I think in it's a part real of his, situation, you know, or it's like part of his character development is he curses more as the movie goes along. Yeah. He's getting in the shit more, so to speak. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it actually kind of means something when he says fucker motherfucker <laughs> at some point. Yeah. Um, that brings our total on this first episode of season three up to 591 um, across 91. all of these films. This is our so, 31st movie. Yeah. I believe out of his official uh, movie count. Um, Dark doesn't count as a movie. And like I've yep. said, more ways than one. Um, and, uh, <laughs> the best of times. Of best, of time. <laughs> the best of times. Best of times. All right, runtime. This had a runtime of 136 minutes, which is the second longest movie that we've ever done uh, behind Face Off, which was 139 minutes. So I don't know why this movie had to be it's, so long. It's not, it doesn't. It, it didn't yeah, feel like too long. Yeah. It didn't feel like it drug like Face Off did in certain points. Yeah. Um, I it felt like moving. this one was pretty well paced even though it is super long. Um, it took me three separate sittings to do the breakdown because it was so freaking long. Um, hours I spent on this stupid thing. So, yeah, I don't know if that's just a... Maybe that's like a mandate of these summer blockbusters. Gotta, gotta make them over two hours so that they can justify paying for the air conditioning for the people going to watch a movie. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but 136 minutes. Nudity, there was none uh, that I saw. <laughs> there was Even Nick the Cage scene. naked for a second, but not actually showing anything, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> this was an R-rated film. Um, she usually, you know, Nowadays, these movies are all PG-13. They don't do the uh, R-rated blockbusters as much anymore because it limits the audience size <clears> you can have. Mm-hmm. <throat> State and country tracker, we did actually add a state. Uh, we were in D.C. and California for the bulk of the movie, but we did go to Kansas for a moment, and it counts. So that brings us up to 17 total states and 17 total countries now. Yeah, it's nice to be able to put something in the uh, flyover states in the heartland <laughs> of America yeah. on the, uh, the, the map that we've been tracking his states with. Uh, budget versus gross, $75 million budget, $335.1 million gross, uh, substantial, uh, uh, whatchamacallit, it return. made money. Return. Yes. Substan- <laughs> substantial return on the investment. <laughs> um, 
which is why Michael Bay just kept rolling along in the 90s and, and early 2000s with these because he was making tons of money off of these movies. Uh, that brings our grand total up to $997.7 million budget, just right below a billion now. And uh, our gross is $2.317 billion. <sighs> I wonder where that number is going to end up. I feel like, you know, we're we're slowly getting through uh, the blockbusters and yeah. we're going to head back into the weeds of the uh, <laughs> direct-to-video movies and stuff. So <clears throat> on our top grossing, that is now the second highest grossing movie behind National Treasure, which made 347.5. Um, so this made, <clears throat> if you go with the Holy tr- Trilogy, um, this was the... Most successful, um, Con Air, or no, Face Off was at 245.7, and then Con Air was at 224. So all three of those movies that all came out within a year of each other made over $220 million each. So <clears throat> huge year for Cage. On the ratings, this is the 15th R-rated film. Um, so now we have no Gs, two PGs. 8 PG-13s, 15 R-rateds, and 6 unrateds, which leads us over to the kill tracker. All right, for kills, he racked up three kills in this one, which brings us to a grand total of 163 kills, uh, no deaths, and then uh, I jokingly said that uh, he was resurrected once, uh, kind because of, <laughs> you put there kind of, <laughs> so yeah. as a joke, but then, nah, he wasn't resurrected, so kinda, we're, still, yeah. we're, we're still like two and two. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, we have so two, only, two total yeah, resurrections two total through all of our films. Yeah, from here on out, after this episode, I'm throwing that shit out because we never yeah. talk about it. Yeah, I think <laughs> until we, we see a resurrection, then yeah. then we'll talk yeah. about it. But uh, yeah, it's kind of funny. Like we talk about it all the time. He started out dying quite a bit when we first started, and now it's, it's been yeah. a hot second. But we have yeah. slowed down uh, substantially. <laughs> yeah. I feel like it was what, like five, six movies in a row. That he died, and then three since then. Yeah. So, what did you think? Let's rank this film on the Kjometer. On to the most important question that uh, we ask on this show, Vince. Where does The Rock from 1996 rate on your Kjometer? This is another one of Nick's movies that I love mainly because I watched it a long time ago and uh, I still have that nostalgic feeling for it. Uh, but overall as a movie, it's not that great of a movie. Uh, so I give it a six out of 10. I think it could have been a lot better if they would have trimmed it down, but they don't. Uh, and they let it run a little too long. Uh, as far as Nick's performance, I give him the same six. Uh, wasn't great, but uh, wasn't awful. I feel like it wasn't as cagey as uh, some of his other Holy Trinity performances. But uh, I don't think he really added anything to the film, but he didn't detract anything. So I think six out of ten for both is pretty pretty accurate. Nigel, where does The Rock rate on your cageometer? <clears throat> yeah, I had seen this one since it came out, um, or shortly after it came out, because I guess I would have been... I would have been nine when this movie came out so I, I think i watched it around then um so i hadn't seen it since the only the only part i remembered is the guy getting the ball in his mouth and then spitting it everywhere that's like the only visual <laughs> part of my in my mind uh, of it uh, but i really enjoyed it um i don't know about really enjoyed it but i, I did enjoy it <laughs> it's my favorite of the trilogy of these uh actions that he did in the 96 97 yeah it's uh it's definitely schlocky but it's high budget high quality schlock that i think uh a lot of those low budget schlock movies uh, uh, try to attain but i think you had star power you had uh, a, a director who knows what he's doing with this type of shit uh and you've got um you know, a serviceable script, I guess. That's a good framework to let them do outlandish, out, outrageous crap, but like cool special effects. The action was good. Um, yeah, it's, it's an entertaining movie. It's definitely one of those movies you can throw on at any point and just have running in the background and look over every once in a while to see some cool shit happening uh, on there. So uh, I give it a seven out of ten because it's 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 entertaining enough. I would watch it again. Um, I can see why this one is a classic. Uh, it's definitely a uh, a worthwhile Michael Bay movie. <laughs> I know that 
not everybody here is a big fan of Michael Bay. I'm not <laughs> myself, but uh, this one's not too bad. Yeah, uh, for what for what it, for what they try to do, I think it's a it's a good it's a good movie for it. It is a bit long. Um, I feel like they could have trimmed out a decent amount of it and still kept all of the cool stuff that keeps it entertaining. Um, it, it did seem kind of, to me. It did feel like it was dragging in some certain parts, mm-hmm. um, and I think it was just because it was. There's not a there doesn't need to be that much going on <laughs> in the film, but uh, it's it's still uh, pretty entertaining. Um, mm-hmm. Sean Connery steals a show. Uh, it's been a long time since I've seen a Sean Connery movie, so it was actually kind of nice to like. I've forgotten how much I enjoyed seeing him and stuff, so it was nice seeing that in there. I definitely look at it like a James Bond sequel. I think it makes the movie um, a lot nicer or a lot better <laughs> in, yeah. in that respect. <laughs> so I I definitely encourage people to think of it that way, especially if they're a fan of bond. If not, it's its own thing. It stands as alone. But, uh, I, I think it, it, it's weird that they originally were looking for Arnold Schwarzenegger to fill that role. Cause if you hadn't <laughs> told me that, I would have felt that this was like 100% them just writing an unofficial James Bond sequel and tacking yeah. Nick Cage into it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it definitely feels been... like they went out of their way to make things as vague as possible so that you could fit it with uh it's weird it's like a mix of vague and specific like oh he was trained by british special services or, or british secret service and mi6 or whatever but uh they disavowed all knowledge of him he was on a super secret mission yeah <laughs> i feel like that uh, might have been like once they found out that connery was taking the role maybe in some of the they rewrites they were like oh yeah it definitely feels like it was intentional nod to it once they got him on yeah. board with it. And he, yeah. he kind of, aside from swearing and being a lot more gritty, he kind of feels like he's still playing an mm-hmm. old grizzled James Bond. But that's also, I think Connery just kind of played the same type Connery's of character. Connery's just cool stuff. in yeah. general, I think. Like he, <laughs> the reason why people consider him the best Bond is him. him. He, he brought that to Bond because that's yeah. how he acts. It's like, it's like Harrison Ford. You get Harrison Ford to do Harrison Ford stuff. He kind of elevates things because of who he is. Connery was the same way. Uh, yeah. But yeah, uh, Cage, to his point, uh, I give him like a six out of 10. I don't really, it, it, I kind of felt like he was kind of didn't, didn't elevate the movie as much as somebody like Sean Connery or even um, Ed Harris did in the mm-hmm. role. I think he was, it may have been because this was the first, blockbuster kind of to pull him out of those indie films. So they didn't quite know how to use him properly, or he didn't quite know how to be, uh, go about this character. Cause he's kind of going for more of that geeky, <laughs> nerdy, likable guy, not an action hero. Um, but, uh, it, he did a good enough job with it. It just felt like there wasn't a lot. You could have kind of swapped him out for other, for somebody else, um, in it, but it's a good, uh, it was a good, platform for him to get out of those roles that he had been doing in the eighties uh, and early nineties and kind of elevate him up to the point where he could become an action star. Um, yeah. and you know, I think this is the movie that, that got people to see him in that light and obviously launched his career into mm. the trajectory that it went on to. I don't know so. that he was really like, like seeking that out. He just was offered the role and people were like, no, you can't do that role. And he was like, Watch me hold my beer. Here we go. <laughs> right. I'll do it. That's kind of cool that Todd Connery was the one that wanted to work with him or, or suggested yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Like that. That must have been pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, that would coming be from like a big fan, a film such an awesome like thing <laughs> for a cage. I'm sure it was just like Sean Connery wanted to do the movie because of me, <laughs> <laughs> which I'm guessing Sean yeah. Connery probably saw leaving Las Vegas and, you know, a few of those other 80s roles like Red Rock West and um, yeah, Wild Heart. You know, everybody wanted to work with Cage there for a while. But he worked with like a lot of the big names. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. This one's it's 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 one of his iconic films, but I don't think it's an iconic role for him, yeah. if that makes sense. It's he's just sort of a yeah. he's just sort of in the movie. He's not really not compared to like something like Face Off, where <laughs> it's like that movie <laughs> is is a platform for Cage uh, mm-hmm. and more Travolta <laughs> in a lot of ways, but um <laughs> Yeah, or or even Con Air, like he's more of a character in Con Air, but also less. I don't know. It's a, he. Yeah, I don't know what I'm going with. <laughs> Maybe I, I, you understand I what, what you're I'm saying. saying. No. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> at least like feels like more of a of a action character in in Con Air than he does in this. He's more of just a, a, a just guy, I guess, a scientist. You know. Yeah, he's helping out. Yeah. On my cageometer, I also gave the movie a seven. Um, this <laughs> is. By far and away, in my opinion, the best Michael Bay movie. Um, there aren't many 
uh, movies I consider <laughs> from Michael Bay that are good. Um, are basically like Bad Boys and this. Uh, the Island. Um, yeah, I'm not a fan. I hate Michael Bay. So that's pretty high praise for me, <laughs> giving him a seven. Um, I felt like the movie, like I didn't feel like it really drug. Um, I hadn't seen the movie in a while, but I had seen it within like the last five years or so. And it still was really enjoyable. Again, you know, it's a movie that I'll definitely watch again which is high marks, you know, for a lot of the movies that we've done. There are a lot of movies that I will never, ever watch again. I, <laughs> I will never watch Spirit of Vengeance ever again. <laughs> Dying of the Light. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, overall, I mean, I felt like the pacing was pretty good. Uh, the antagonist was great. Ed Harris did a great job. Um, I feel like his his uh, henchmen were a little, you know, throwaway Uh his major guy, I can't remember his name, but that guy's been in a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. He didn't really have much to do, but I feel like in the scenes that he had, he really kind of pulled you in. It was, his name was Baxter, Dave, I think David I wrote. Morse, I think is his yeah, name, something, something like that. His, his character's name was Major Baxter. Okay. Um, I wrote it down because I was like, hey, it's that guy from everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's in tons of stuff. <laughs> um, I felt like, uh, you know, the Womack Forsyth characters – could have been interchangeable, but at the same time, I felt like they both did, you know, Forsyth always is great when he shows up and things. Um, and this, he also was kind of just a gruff guy, but he, you could <laughs> tell he had a conscience. And whereas Womack seemed like a dick and didn't have a conscience. And, and of course, Connery, Connery is, you know, the reason that this movie holds up and the reason that people love this movie is not because of Nick Cage, it's because of Sean Connery. Mm -hmm. Cage is great as kind of the, the comic relief in the buddy comedy uh, story here. But Sean Connery is just so freaking cool in everything that he does that he just steals the show. Um, so I'll, I'll go over to cage. I gave him a six as well because it didn't feel like he really brought a whole lot to the character, but he was uh, his chemistry with cage or uh, with Connery was really great. Um, I felt like they had a really nice back and forth and, um, I think maybe that's because of the mutual respect uh, that they had for each other as actors. Yeah. And I, mm -hmm. it, it makes me happy to see that Honoré recognized Cage's like brilliance at that point, you know, cause I feel like uh, to somebody who's not an actor, Cage kind of can come off as a terrible actor, <laughs> but I think to a really trained actor and a trained eye, they see the brilliance of what Cage is bringing to the roles and stuff. And I think he knew that he didn't have to bring too much. He just had to be the the geeky guy who was able to defuse those bombs. And ultimately he was the one who saved the day with the, the green flares, even though he probably shouldn't have been able to stand after <laughs> shooting himself in the heart with something that was liquid based and not aerosol based. Anyway, <laughs> there's a lot of like goofy things about this movie and a lot of things that, that detract from the, the quality. And it's like and Nigel said, it's very schlocky, but it still holds up. I mean, it's a really fun movie. Yeah. And I think it's uh it's one that endures and uh, will continue to endure. Yeah. It's quotable. It's got good action. Yeah. You know. It's, and like you said, it's, it's, a, it's an iconic Nick Cage movie, but not an iconic Nick Cage role. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like a perfect summary, I think. Yeah. Here it is. The moment you've all been waiting for. These are the cagiest moments of the film. Yes, she's here. Bring it to me now. Thank you, Phil. What's that? Hey, don't. Freeze, mister! Come oh, man! Help! Drop the gun, or I drop your boss. We you will not! Ah. My stomach's doing hula hoops around my ass. <laughs> Alright, you wanna play tough? You wanna play tough with me? Okay, FBI! Freeze, sucker! I'll fire. No, you won't. Throw down. We didn't mean what you just said, did you? When? It, just right now, when you were talking about bringing a child into the world and having it be an act of cruelty. I meant it at the time. 
Stanley, at the time, you said it seven and a half seconds ago. Well, gosh, kind of a lot's happened since then. Look, we're not even married. Mason, where are you going? 30 years ago, I vowed I wouldn't die in this toilet. You're not leaving! There's a madman in there with his hand on a, on a button! Did you know it was originally a civil war fork? Oh, really? Huh. Yeah, wow. You know, I like history, too, and maybe when this is all over, you and I can stop by the souvenir shop together. But right now, I just... I just think I want to find some rockets. Peach sorbet persuasion. Oh, this isn't happening. Oh, so you don't have to answer it. This isn't happening. No, just don't answer. It's okay. You've been around a lot of corpses. Is that normal? Well, the feet thing? Yeah, the feet thing. Yeah, that happens. I'm having kind of a hard time concentrating. Can you do something about it? Like what? Kill him again? Listen, I'm just a biochemist. Most of the time, I work in a glass jar and lead a very uneventful life. I drive a Volvo, beige one. But what I'm dealing with here is one of the most deadly substances the Earth has ever known. So what do you say you cut me some friggin' slack? Thank you for that. You could have handled it differently. What do you say we cut the chit-chat a-hole? You almost got... That's it for this episode of One Cage at a Time. As always, be sure to drop us an email at onecagepodcast at gmail.com to let us know if we missed anything, or hit us up with suggestions to improve the show, comments, compliments, or simply to gush about the legend that is Nicolas Cage. Uh, Next up, we'll be doing a movie I've been looking forward to since we first discovered that it existed. The uh, 2017 pseudo-sequel to Deadfall, (laughs) Arsenal. Um literally no reason to be called Arsenal, by the way. (laughs) Don't even understand why it's called that. Uh, Nicolas Cage reprises his role of Eddie King somehow, despite spoilers, dying in Deadfall, (laughs) where Eddie holds a guy's brother for ransom, so they turn to a plainclothes detective played by John Cusack to uh, not actually help them unleash vengeance. They we'll get to it um (laughs) to fight eddie and his gang and get his brother back um it's the guy from uh uh entourage he's the main guy um the guy who's like the star who has the entourage in entourage if you ever watch that show um and then the guy who was the lead singer in the band for that thing you do never seen him in anything else (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I feel like they really drew inspiration from Deadfall because it is absolutely terrible. (laughs) (laughs) So should be a fun time for all of us. Um, (sighs) Make sure to check it out wherever fine films are sold or on your streaming service of choice. Until then, we'll say goodbye the way we do each and every episode with our Nicolas Cage quote of the film. You went down the incinerator chute, on the mine car, through the tunnels to the power plant, under the steam engine, that was really cold by the way, and into the cistern through the intake pipe, but <clears throat> how in the name of Zeus's butthole did you get out of your cell? I only ask because in our current situation, well, it could prove to be useful information. Maybe! Thanks for listening to One Cage at a Time. Visit us online at onecageatatime.com or follow us on the social media platform of your choice for more Nicolas Cage goodness. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you really like the show, become a member of our Patreon where you can download unedited and ad-free episodes as well as listen to our follow-up show, Back Into the Cage, where we re-examine each movie to discuss what we missed the first time around, answer listener questions, and wax poetic about the man, the myth, the legend that is Nicolas Cage. I'd take pleasure in gutting you, boy. I'll take pleasure in gutting you, boy. What's wrong with these people, huh, Mason?
Don't you think there's a lot of uh, a lot of anger flowing around this island? Kind of a pubescent volatility, don't you think? A lot of angst, a lot of um, 16, I'm angry at my father syndrome. I mean, grow up! We're stuck on an island with a bunch of violence for pleasure-seeking psychopathic marines. Shame on them! <clears throat>